please follow us on the social medias, especially on our YouTube channel. So there we are going to be able to uh, know, uh, to, to follow all of the meetings that we already had and to share with your colleagues and with your team uh, if you like this meeting, if you think this is going to be interesting uh, for, for your team. Uh, we the chat box. Yes. Grace, we don't hear you. Okay, sorry, it's my, my, my internet connection now is better. Sorry for that. No, okay. So, so uh, please follow us on social media and uh, especially register to our YouTube channel so you can share this meeting with your colleagues and with your team and you can see our uh, last uh, events. We want to invite you for a lot of nice things that we have prepared for you for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we are going to have the celebration of the seventh, sixth anniversary of the BTT uh, shunt. We are going to have two very nice meetings with an amazing faculty in a very nice program. So please uh, join us on these two days, November the 3rd and uh, December the 7th. We are going to have a very interesting uh, a talk, a webinar talking about pediatric cardiac critical care and the brain. How every uh, healthcare provider who is involved with the ICU care of the cardiac patient can make their, their, their kids outcome, neurological outcome better. So please uh, join us on December the 1st. We are going to have a very nice uh, uh, webinar with Dr. Gil Vernovsky, and we are going. He is going to talk about uh, co cognitive dissonance, and Dr. Mary Cohen is going to talk about uh, women in pediatric cardiology. We are going to have talks about Seymour training and leadership as well. This is going to be a very nice session. On the 14th of December, Dr. Normal Silverman is going to talk about anomalous pulmonary venous connections, the correlation between echo imaging and morphology. It's going to be very nice. On the 17th of December, we have a fetal uh, cardiology uh, update. It's going to be uh, uh, very interesting as well. And every Friday, we have Dr. Anderson with amazing topics of the morphology of the congenital heart defects. And now we are going to start uh, uh, our, our meeting uh, of today. We are very, very happy uh, uh, to have all of you with us today. And I wanted to introduce our first speaker and who is uh, also uh, the coordinator uh, of this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for organizing that for us. So Dr. Anusha is a junior faculty at SickKids and surgeon scientist with a research focus in clinical epidemiology and data science. As a faculty research consultant in the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society, she leads multiple projects and has a special interest in anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. And uh, you can uh, make your introduction for uh, this webinar and your talk. You're muted as well. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. It's great to see all of you. I think we have a really great program with a lot of fantastic speakers. And I hope this gives you a real overview of what um, the questions are that we're facing with anomalous aortic coronary of a coronary artery. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Perfect. So as um, Grace mentioned, my interest in this lesion stems from the time that I was doing my PhD at the CHSS Data Center, where I helped start the cohort for AOCA to help answer many of the unknowns that we are dealing with. So today I'll be taking through the following topics. As this is the first talk of the day, I thought I'd give you a brief, brief overview of the lesion for those of you less familiar with it, and then focus on risk stratification as well as surgical complications from, taken from the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society data. So we're gonna talk about the anatomy and classification, pathophysiology, which will include risk stratification, epidemiology, natural history, and the unnatural history, or what we think of as the outcomes following surgical repair and the associated complications. 
So to begin, coronary artery anomalies are the most common form of congenital heart congenital cardiovascular disease, and they were prevalent similar to all other congenital cardiac conditions. Most have a benign natural history with minimal clinical implications. And one of these anomalies is AOCA, and while patients are usually asymptomatic and diagnosed incidentally, AOCA can also present with sudden death or symptoms, such as ischemia, arrhythmia, and sudden cardiac death. And sudden events are most common between the ages of 12 and 22, and most commonly occur after vigorous exercise. With regard to anatomy and classification, for AOCA, the problem lies in the fact that there are numerous variants based on which coronary artery is anomalous, whether it's left or right, the course of the coronary artery, whether it's interarterial or intramural, or has another less common course, such as being intraconal, which we're gonna talk about today, prepulmonic, retroaortic, or retrocardiac, and the morphology of the ostium, including features such as whether it's high or slit-like. The issue that arises is that we still don't clearly understand which of these variations allows survival without ischemia. From this, we can see that these lesions are often classified based on which coronary artery is anomalous, the origin and the course. However, they can also be further subdivided by those which are hemodynamically relevant, uh, such as some interarterial and intramural AOCA, and some non, which are non-hemodynamically relevant, such as most prepulmonic or retroaortic courses. The reason that I'm using the term some and most when describing these is that there will always be cases that fall outside of these paradigms. And while certainly there are variants that are generally thought to be benign, this is not always the case. And this is something that must be kept in mind when evaluating patients. So moving on to pathophysiology, the anatomic features that are usually thought to be high risk include having a slit-like orifice, as demonstrated here in comparison to the normal round ostium of the non-anomalous vessel. An interarterial course, although as the CHSS study demonstrated, this is found in almost all cases, making its significance really less clear. An intramural course, running within the wall of the aorta, potentially further compromised by the permissural pillar, and an acute takeoff angle, uh, whereby the proximal part of the coronary artery takes off at an angle less than 45 degrees with a tangential course. And finally, a proximal narrowing defined as a narrowing of greater than 50% of the cross-sectional vessel diameter in comparison to the distal vessel, or an elliptical proximal vessel shape defined as a height to width ratio of greater than a third with segmental hypoplasia. And this often occurs in conjunction with an intramural vessel. So from our CHSS study presented in AATS in 2018, we found that there were several features found to be associated with ischemia. These included being anomalous left. And for patients with anomalous left, uh, they were further compromised if they had an intramural course, the presence of a high orifice, which was previously thought to be benign by many, or a slit-like orifice. And for patients with anomalous right, ischemia was associated with having a longer intramural course, and our median value was around 8.6. This study also importantly found that anomalous right is not a benign lesion, which was often historically thought to be the case. And we had an important proportion of patients experiencing ischemia and sudden cardiac events. So in our study of 49 patients with ischemia, 20 had, uh, were anomalous right, so that's 41%. In addition, of 18 out of 49 patients who had sudden cardiac events, six were anomalous right, or a third. And in total, there were six patients out of 417 um, who had these sudden cardiac events, so for a total of 1%, in comparison to 12% who are anomalous left. So as we know, these anatomic abnormalities can lead to physiologic consequences. So vigorous physical exercise leads to increased cardiac outputs that can cause osteo obstruction from vessel expansion. Uh, there is also in conjunction with increased heart rate, there's decreased diastolic filling, which can lead to ischemia and arrhythmia. And the increased pressure and volume overload, which occurs during systole, can cause aortic root dilation, compressing the proximal intramural segment. Flow restriction can also be exacerbated from the relatively non-compliant pericommissural area. And these can ultimately result in ischemia under stress in areas perfused by the anomalous vessel. Or patchy areas of myocardial fibrosis, which can serve as substrate for lethal cardiac arrhythmias. And one important thing to assure when you're evaluating every patient, and I'm sure Julie's gonna talk about this, is that you ensure that the coronary territory matches the region of abnormality on provocative ischemia testing. 
With regard to the epidemiology and natural history, the prevalence of AOCA is estimated to be between 0.1 to 0.7% 0.7 of the general population, with some estimates as high as 2%. It's the second leading cause of sudden cardiac death in otherwise healthy young individuals. However, it's really impossible to know the true problems. And the reason we say this is because the general population is not examined for this lesion without a clinical indication. So in this article by Chisholm et al. from Jack in 2017, they reviewed 77 studies with a reported prevalence of AOCA and reported the prevalence of AOCA among more than a million patients. Looking at all angiography, they found a prevalence of 0.44%, from all echo, 0.15%, from CT angiograms, 0.82, and from MR angiogram, 0.7. So you can see there must be some differences in the modalities regarding how well they can elucidate uh, the anomaly. They also included 20 studies which looked for the, exam, uh, the presence of interarterial left and right, and they found that there was a prevalence of left of 0.03% and right of 0.23%. So with regard to sudden cardiac risk in adults, we often are asked the question, is it the same as in younger patients? And while many feel that the risk drops off if patients don't present in their use, there are also multiple case reports in the literature. And you know, they just are so many, but a couple that stood out were a 40-year-old farmer who had chest pain, who had an abnormal treadmill ECG and abnormal stress echo. He was found to, inter found to have an interarterial right with a low takeoff. And again, this is a lesion that was historically thought to be benign and underwent reimplantation. A 27 year old previous asymptomatic male who had a VF arrest while playing basketball. Again, anomalous right that was thought to be benign in the past um, and underwent cabbage. So while there are many more cases like this, the reason that I'm highlighting this to you is that yes, this can often be a lesion that needs to be considered in adulthood. Finally, with respect to competitive athletes, the following is a rough estimation of risk for these patients. It's currently estimated that there are 8.5 competi million competitive athletes in the US, both in high school and collegiate sports. And if we use the estimates of anomalous left and right from the Chisholm article of 0.03 to 0.23%, that gives us between 2,500 to 20,000 athletes um, in the US. And with anomalous left or right. And if the CDC estimates that there's currently 1,500 sudden cardiac deaths per year in the US and those under 25, um, there was another study by Marin that estimated that AOCA caused 17% of sudden cardiac deaths in young athletes. That gives us about 250 deaths from AOCA per year in the US. I'll now move on to the unnatural history or the risk of surgery. So again, there's a wide variety of repair strategies used based on the underlying lesion. The most common is unroofing, which is frequently done for an intramural course, whereby the inner wall is cut away. And this may occur with or without having to manipulate the commissure of the aortic valve, depending on where the anomalous corner is located. So if it's behind the commissural post, you may have to take down and resuspend the commissure. Patch osteoplasty, where a patch is added at the site of the narrowed ostium. Reimplantation where the anomalous coronary is moved to the appropriate sinus and pulmonary artery translocation, whereby the PA is moved laterally to diminish interarterial coronary compression. In many studies, we found that operative mortality is low, but as with any surgery, it's important to recognize that while mortality may be low, that it can vary greatly by center insertion experience, especially in those cases where the anatomy isn't straightforward. So with respect to complications, short and midterm complications reported in the literature include the standard risk related to all complications in cardiac surgery, such as bleeding, wound infection, and pericardial effusions, as well as surgery-specific complications, such as coronary osteostenosis, new aortic insufficiency, new abnormal ejection fraction, and sudden cardiac death. The most recent CHSS study presented at AHS in 2019 found the following in a cohort of 387 patients from 45 centers. We found that 80 patients underwent isolated and roofing with or without commissural manipulation, and an additional 6% each underwent patch osteoplasty, reimplantation, and PA translocation. So to summarize the results from this study, we found that of 395 repairs starting from the top, that while mortality was low, and it's shown on the right-hand side of your screen, with, we had three deaths uh, following elective repair. In addition, 
coronary related reoperations was higher than expected. So on the far left of your screen, with 13 patients undergoing 15 coronary related reoperations for 3%. We also found that 8% or 2% had new mild or moderate AI associated with conventional manipulation. So 8% if we consider it to be mild or 2% if we consider it to be moderate. 2% had new abnormal ejection fraction and 4% had new postoperative ischemia if their postoperative tests were considered at any time or 2% if we just looked at their last test. Now, as we all know, uh, ischemia tests can have variable results, sometimes eliciting a positive response and sometimes not. So that's why we have these varying ranges. The overall composite risk using all of these um, turned out to be seven to 13% for the entire cohort. Now, then on the next slide, I'm gonna show you what do we mean by surgical adverse events. So our definition of adverse events included postoperative ischemia defined as ischemia by symptoms or testing, death following an elective case, coronary related reoperations or new postoperative ECMO, in addition to new greater than or equal to moderate AI, and new abnormal ejection fractions. So when we looked at this, we then found subgroups of interest which had increased risk versus the total cohort or decreased risk. So when we looked at patients who had preoperative ischemia, they had a much higher risk, 21 to 33%. A anomalous patients who had anomalous left, they had 14 to 20% risk of an adverse event. Repair strategies other than unroofing were 12 to 19%, and unroofing with commissural manipulation was 7 to 15%. Then we looked at those patients who had decreased our risk. So anomalous right has much less risk and anomalous left, so 4 to 10%. Patients who underwent isolated and roofing, which is a fairly straightforward procedure without commercial manipulation, had a risk of 5 to 9% of one of these adverse events. And patients without preoperative ischemia also had decreased risk versus the overall population of 4 to 9%. Other important things that I wanted to point out to you was of the 64 patients with known preoperative ischemia, Following repair, 13 remained ischemic, so 20%. 28% had resolution of their ischemia, and there were also 23 patients, or 36%, uh, who were untested without symptoms. We were surprised to find that patients were not cleared following surgery, and wanted to point out that this is now part of the guidelines that patients get tested following their surgery and cleared uh, for return to activity. We also found that freedom from mild aortic insufficiency was lower in those with versus without commissural manipulation, suggesting that strategies to avoid commissural takedown may avoid new AI, such as strategies like neo-osteal window creation and aortocoronary windows. In conclusion, the management of AOCA is more complex than often perceived, uh, related to challenges of diagnosis, risk stratification, and management. Surgery is not always the answer and can result in important morbidity and mortality and more research and collaboration are required, especially between pediatric and adult programs to determine the lifelong outcome of these patients who've had surgery and those who are conservatively managed. I'd like to quickly put in a note for our monthly forum that we host with Julie Brothers and myself. And this is a forum where surgeons and cardiologists can present any cases that they're looking for second opinions for, uh, probably giving a quick five minute presentation uh, which is followed by 10 minutes of discussion where they can get opinions from experts in the field. And if you'd like to be placed on our mailing list, please feel free to email me at the following address. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Thank you, Anusha. I think we can now proceed to our next uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Massimo Padarino. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce him. He's a friend and mentor. Um, he is currently an associate professor and, and senior consultant in pediatric and congenital cardiac surgery at the University Hospital in Padua. Um, he's very active on research on different topics but uh, he was very uh, focused on the AAOCA and he has presented his research projects in different national and international meetings. So he's sharing with us today the results from the European Congenital Heart Surgeons uh, Association uh, Registry. Uh, welcome, Massimo. 
Um, dear colleagues, friends, it's a very a good pleasure, a real pleasure to be here. Uh, let me put the presentation on. Can you see it? <laughs> okay, so um, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all the organizers. It's very nice for me to be here and to share with all of you the results of our registry, our, um, our studies in Europe about this uh, rare anomaly. Uh, I have no disclosures. Um, just as a few few things that I want to remind, um, Anusha was very um, complete in her presentation. So we she presented all the correct, main characteristics of the uh, so-called AUCA. Uh, most physicians currently agree that AUCA are congenital defects that can lead to clinical significant manifestation, which are actually related to uh, exertion related transient myocardial ischemia, which can give so sudden cardiac death as a sign of manifestation. Uh, what actually we should consider is not only the anatomy, because Anusha um, clearly defined the kind of anatomy of the different types of anomalous coronary, but also most importantly, the functional behavior of these anomalies during strenuous exertion, so during effort, sport training, competition. We all know that this anomaly is, uh, occurs and uh, show, show up during effort. And I guess that Dr. Lorita is going to show us later a very interesting um, study that they are doing in Milan about this. Uh, the possible mechanism of being introduced by Anusha, so is, um, they are related to the typical anomaly, which is the intramural course or the interarterial course or the coronary osteal anomalies. Essentially, the intramural course um, anatomy is um, an important mechanism of ischemia because the lateral compression uh, during an increase of systolic pressure, arterial systolic arterial pressure, can produce a narrowing of the lumen of the anomalous coronary at the site where the anomalous coronary crosses from the anomalous to the normal side of the aorta. So it's very variable. It depends on a lot of uh, feet, a lot of characteristics such as the length of the intramural course and the position. And, um, and uh, as we, as I like to stress that rarely the manifestation of the core anomaly is seen in sedentary individuals. Um, so um, as Anusha has already said, there are still a lot of questions more than, uh, than answers to the, in this kind in this topic. Uh, we don't know exactly which is the correct surgical indication, or which is the best surgical treatment or which is the indication to conservative management in certain cases. There are a lot of single center studies that were done in the past, and now actually there are more efforts to do multi-center and so increased numbers, like we saw in the CHSS experience, to have more data and more reliable data. So what, we've, what has been done in the United States and what we have tried to do in Europe is to create data collection, possibly retrospective, but also longitudinal precise data collection, and analysis of all data, anatomical details, history, and imaging, especially the you know, clinical history is very important in this patient. To have, so we need to have a very important and very detailed clinical history. So in the, in the world, especially in the North America, they started multi-institutional registers as we saw, to what is the, 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 the target of this thing, is to produce multidisciplinary evidence-based management strategies. And that's what was done by the colleagues from CHSS. They, they started far, a lot of time ago, just a lot before we started in Europe. And uh, they wanted to establish evidence-based guidelines for the management of the outcome. Uh, so far, uh, actually there have been a lot of work and currently there are some guidelines produced by the most important society in the in, uh, United States and Europe. As far as the American Heart Association, we have finally some recommendation for the anomalous articoronia coronary arteries uh, treatment. So we can see the surgery is recommended, uh, like uh, uh, evidence-based, so it's a um, type one, is recommended in any kind of anomalous articoronary artery with symptoms or with ischi documented ischemia or with positive provocative tests. While it's considered to be reasonable in left corner without symptoms or without ischemia, or in uh, any kind of AOCA with, oops, sorry, with uh, uh, onset of ventricular arrhythmias. On the other hand, surgery or continue, there's some, it's not very clear actually in my opinion in this case, because they suggest surgery of continued observation, 
may be reasonable for a patient without symptoms, with left or right coronary, that they do not have uh, an anatomy or a, a physiological evaluation that can suggest a potential for compromised coronary perfusion. So it's not really a guideline, it's just uh, the, the responsibility actually is given to the single doctor. Uh, in Europe, very recent guidelines have been produced by the European Society of Cardiology, very, very recent. And surgery is recommended, they are pretty similar to what uh, the American has said. Surgery is recommended in anomalous scoring with symptoms and with evidence of stress induced ischemia in matching territory or even high risk anatomy. So it's pretty close to what Americans said. And we say here in Europe, it, surgery should be considered in those cases of left coronary artery without symptoms and without evidence of ischemia by risk anatomy. On the other hand, surgery is not recommended, so it's more drastic, I would say, for uh, asymptomatic right coronary anomaly with, uh, with, uh, without myocardial ischemia. So uh, there's another advancement for, uh, for, uh, that can give some more indication to surgeons. Uh, we saw the surgical treatment, so we can, we can actually summarize the surgical treatment usually indicated for the left coronary and uh, is uh, any kind of left coronary, even if there's some now um, doubts about the uh, left coronary without symptoms, and in patient with right coronary with symptoms. We saw that there are different kind of uh, anomal different kind of surgical treatment. The most common has been the, the unroof core, unroofing uh, technique. We have the translocation, which has been actually learned from the transposition of the red arteries. We have the, the translocation of the pulmonary artery, which actually doesn't solve the anatomical um, problem, but actually give more space to the coronary not to be compressed. And this is something that actually, in my opinion, is something that has to be considered as an additional procedure. And finally, we have the so-called anatomical repair, osteoplasty, uh, which is gonna probably be very well described by Dr. Ruski. So it's a, it's a procedure that the colleagues from Necare have been very, um, very good at it. So um, Americans started a long time ago. We in Europe, we started thinking about doing something about this in 2014. And that's been a long, long way to go to get to a European registry. Our problems are actually that European Union, we have different regulations. So administration, sport restriction, everything is very difficult. So it's difficult to, to match together different, uh, different uh, nations. And we have different health systems and follow-up clinics. And we have also practically, we have different languages which make the evaluation of surgical reports very difficult to do. So what we've done is the first step for was the um, um, a retrospective study from the ECHSA, the European Congenital Surgeons Association in which we wanted actually to focus only on early and late outcomes in a large surgical series in Europe to evaluate safety and effectiveness of this surgical procedure for ALCA. This was, as I said, a retrospective clinical multicenter study, which involved 14 centers. Actually, 13 centers were European. One center was from the United States. Um, uh, all these patients were patient surgical patients since 1991, so retrospective from, and uh, we excluded only the patient with high coronary takeoff. Uh, we have a common database and we focus actually on the uh, anatomical characteristic of the um, right coronary, the anomalous right coronary, the anomalous left coronary, and other variants that were included were the LED or the circumflex from anterior sinus and the single coronary. And we also give some um, special attention to the coronary course, interarterial, intramural, anterior to the aorta or other. So we were able to produce a, a, a paper that was pro presented at the uh, European Association um, uh, meeting in 2018. Uh, we were able to collect 156 patients. Um, it's pretty interesting that of course the uh, right coronary was more common compared to the left coronary as is known from the literature. The patient were most commonly having an interarterial course and intramural course was found in 62.8%. Uh, most of the patients were obviously asymptomatic, about 90% of patients were asymptomatic. But it's also important to know that there was a certain uh, uh, quantity of patients who were, no presenting, were presenting no symptoms at all, in which the indication was actually given 
uh, basing on a, a provocative test or high-risk anatomy. It's interesting to see how the, the, heat, the age here is totally, is much higher compared to the, of course, uh, experience in uh, the American uh, group, since this was a, a multi-center study who was involving pediatric and also adult centers. So we have a lot of adults who have been operated in this, in this series. Uh, interestingly, and uh, probably also it's um, pretty um, predictable, the um, lowest age was in left coronary artery was operated. Um, as far as intraoperative and operative, preoperative data, we know that uh, the age, as we said, the age was, um, median age was about um, the third, in the third decade. But it's important to see that the unroofing procedures was actually, as we said, the more common and was actually the one with the um, lower age uh, operation. Here we have also a range between a half, half a year or 67 years, very wide range, but we have also very, uh, we have also a lot of children here, here and also in the coronary implantation group. It's important to see that the use of bypass graft is uh, at the third position in this series. So it's about 15% of patients who, who are using a uh, CAPG. And this is because actually the quantity of adult patient needing uh, operation, so having symptoms or having uh, imaging indication was pretty high. And so we had a lot of, uh, a big, one, big um, number of patients, adult patients who required catch. Uh, but among post-operative complication, it's interesting to, uh, to see that the most important and worst complication were in the left coronary artery anomaly. And uh, the mechanical support was uh, present in a small percentage, but was not trivial. And of course, was more present in the left coronary. We had a very low uh, operative death with just two patients who died, but actually these patients were patients who presented in the hospital with very, very, very bad preoperative condition. One patient was a, had a cardiac attack, a sudden cardiac death event in, uh, on the, in the, out of the hospital. The other one was having a very low uh, preoperative uh, function. And these patients were actually in old age. Um, so we evaluate patients that follow up. Uh, unfortunately, the follow up was not that long. So that's a major limitation of this pretty big number of patients. We had a median follow up of about two years, and, uh, but it was pretty complete. Um, what is important to see is that like Anusha demonstrated before, even among patients who have been operated, there were some persistence of symptoms. And these symptoms were actually um, the typical symptoms of before operation. So chest pain, dyspnea, fatigue, syncope, palpitation. Uh, but what is important in, my, in our opinion is that actually the operation um, was, uh, it was possible half of the patient after operation at a, at a, at a short follow-up went, went back to their normal life. So we we'll go went back to sport. And uh, the onset of adverse events was not trivial, was about 9%. And we had also some coronary related adverse events. We had some late deaths and some so-called coronary related, so ischemia related events, which are, uh, were not trivial. Uh, on a multivariate logistic regression, we could find some interesting things. Um, Actually, we noticed that those people who were going back to sport were actually the young people. So we can see that actually young people were going back to their life, their normal life, which is pretty important. And that the unroofing procedure was a very good procedure in our hands, in a sense it looked to be protective from uh, sudden cardiac death in the future. Mm, for what it can help, the couple of my words were, as far as survival was, were very good. As far as the various events, on a, on, a, on a, let's say, on a 10 year um, interval, uh, the answer of adverse events was pretty high. So uh, we concluded it was a safe procedure in a large sample with low protein mortality and low rate of early complication, which were really usually related to preoperative conditions. Um, and roof and coronary implantation were the most common and safest procedure with a 0% operative mortality. While in this series, CAPG was a good option for older patients with diffuse vasculopathy. 
most patients were asymptomatic, even some symptoms were persisting. And interestingly, young patients weren't going back to normal life. And occurrence of a late adverse event was not negligible. So we were, uh, of course, um, uh, pushing for a, a long-term surveillance, which was, it was considered to be mandatory. So if we consider surgical surgery safe, you can say yes. If it's effective, we're not sure. Uh, the fact that surgery uh, for normal aortic origin artery can be still uh, characterized in the postoperative course in the long term by persistence of symptoms and problems is already known in literature. And, and it's also known by our colleagues that uh, uh, it's a very difficult uh, what to do after this kind of operation, how we can send patients to go back to their normal life or, or tell them to go back to the exercise restriction. But in our study, what we wanted to know is also, is important for this patient to go, to be operated to, most of the patients are young. They want to go back to their normal life. And also our colleagues from, um, from the CHSS, Julie Brothers also published also some, some interesting paper regarding the fact that patients who have been non-operating and they, are, they have this problem leading for the sort of uh, life lifelong condemnation that they cannot do anything. They live probably uh, uh, apparently a normal life, but uh, psychologically speaking, this is a very, uh, very difficult situation to, to, to tolerate. So um, what we did was to try to compare surgical versus medical patients uh, to try to understand if there were dif difference in outcomes and, and if, the effective, if the surgery were really effective compared to not doing anything. And so we included also a couple of medical centers. Uh, so we were able to publish another paper, including 16, so including all the patients from the, from the former study, plus some other patients who were not included before because they're medical. So we, are, we were able to collect also six in addition, 61 additional medical patients who were having, as you can see, a lower in age uh, uh, inclusion. And uh, um, what we could see is that uh, actually there were not significant difference in uh, incidence of um, right or left coronary as compared to surgical patients or the surgical paper. Um, it was evident that intramural patients were more often surgical patients. The anterior to pulmonary, so the benign form was of, often uh, more common in medical patients. That uh, of course, patient with symptoms and with um, with uh, important uh, symptoms like uh, uh, cardiac, uh, sudden cardiac death event or similar cardiac death event on uh, where, of course, a patient who went through surgery. But interestingly, both, uh, both groups were having similar preoperative sport activities. So this means that this patient that's considered quality of life, preoperative quality of life, they, all, they were almost similar. So we evaluated clinical data at follow-up even in this case, the follow-up is not that long, unfortunately. And um, we evaluate those patients, surgical and medical, as far as um, difference in outcomes. We couldn't find very, probably for the, for the short term of the follow-up, we couldn't find so many uh, important data, um, so different differences between the two groups. So interventional surgical late death were almost similar. Um, what is actually interesting was that uh, um, using this data and um, using a propensity score test, we could, have, we could confirm that the return of sport activity in surgical patients was significantly higher than in medical patients. So what can we say? We can say that actually in these kids or in this patient, young patient, surgery can be considered partially effective because actually we were able to give them a chance to go back to their quality of life. But we are not sure yet, we don't know yet, uh, if we, uh, we don't know it so far, we don't know if uh, we have um, uh, minimized the risk of ischemia in this patient in the future with the operation. For this reason, we have started with design a prospective multicenter study, and actually is what the CHSS is doing, but for us was a long step to go and uh, with identification of objective evidence of ischemia in surgical and medical patients, we have at least a minimum follow-up of five years. We have a database that can be shared from everybody. And uh, so 
uh, to get also with a final proposal for a standard follow-up diagnostic and clinical strategy for patients with anomalous aortic coronary, either surgical or medical patients. For this reason, we started in February 2019 this Euro Prospective Registry, which is ongoing, which is actually uh, including nowadays about 10, 10, um, 10 centers, medical and surgical, all over Europe. Our objective was actually to evaluate prospectively uh, this patient to understand when we have to operate, who we have to operate, can we screen from prevention for sudden cardiac death, which kind of follow-up of protocol is effective, can this patient return safely to aesthetic life of surgery after surgery? So all the questions that we all have. So far, we are collecting data. The data collection is pretty easy now because we have arranged a red cap database, which is available online, very easy. And, uh, is, um, and so we are collecting patients and data from, uh, from different centers around the Europe. And with this, I hope, I thank you for this opportunity. I encourage everybody in Europe or in the world, this can be a world database, uh, to send us data to contact me if you, if you want to cooperate. And I hope that in three years from now, I can give you some more uh, replies and answer to our questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. So the next question that I'd like to, the next question I'd like to introduce is Julie Brothers. Um, we'd be very happy to have her here today. She is the, she's a pediatric cardiologist in the Division of Cardiology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and is an associate professor of pediatrics at the Claremont School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also the medical director of the Coronary Anomaly Program and was instrumental in starting the AASA cohort uh, in conjunction with the General High School Society. She's someone that I work closely with and have great respect for, and it's great to have her here speaking to us today. Great. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation and for this uh, very nice introduction. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the preoperative patient evaluation. And while I have no disclosures, um, I do want to just say this is going to be a very practical and clinically oriented talk today. I'd like to start out with three patients whom I saw in the coronary anomalies clinic to give you a kind of feeling of what I normally see. Patient A is a 14-year-old male athlete who presents with several episodes of near syncope immediately after cross-country races. He developed nausea, pallor, and one-time documented hypotension when he sought medical attention down to this blood pressure in the 60s over 40s. It took him a while to recover from symptoms. He wasn't able to just go back and go right back into exercise. He otherwise denied chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations, or true syncope. Review of systems was otherwise negative and the family history was non-contributory. Given that, an EKG was done, which was normal, and an echocardiogram was performed, which showed this. Patient B is an eight-year-old male who was initially seen in the cardiology clinic for dizziness during football and running. Echocardiogram initially was done and was read as normal, and he underwent an exercise test that was also normal. Several months later, after playing basketball at his house, his father heard a loud thud, and he was found, patient was found on the ground. He was rigid for a couple of minutes and then lethargic for a couple of hours after. He was taken to an outside hospital where there was a concern for a seizure, an EEG was performed, which was normal. And after being sent to his pediatrician, she then referred him back to cardiology because she thought this was something that was just not normal. So this time an echo was done, which we focused much more closely on the coronary anatomy. And you can see there's a suggestion of a left coronary artery arising anomalously. Patient C is a 15-year-old female athlete who presents for a heart murmur heard at a recent well child visit. The review of systems are otherwise non-contributory. She does high school track, cross country, and soccer teams without any symptoms. Her family history was non-contributory. Exam was significant for a two out of six systolic ejection murmur heard at the left sternal border. A baseline EKG was done. There were some mild abnormalities, and for this reason, an echocardiogram was performed. And it shows this, where you can see this left coronary that kind of looks like it's not arising normally and kind of going away from the aorta, though. 
So before we talk about patient evaluation, I wanted to briefly review the subtypes of AOCA. And Anusha did touch on this. I wanted to show you a, a really nice illustration, I think. Um, the blue here is, oops, sorry, the blue here is a prepulmonic course of the anomalous left coronary artery that is usually believed to be benign. The purple here is a retro cardiac course that is extremely rare. I've actually never seen this before. The green is a retroaortic course that is commonly benign, but there have been some case reports of ischemia when there is a slit-like opening in intramural course. The orange is the subpulmonic or intraseptal intraconal course of the left main coronary artery or left anterior descending. While this is also commonly benign, there have also been recent reports of patients with cardiovascular symptoms and testing suggestive of ischemia, which I will show you at the end of this talk. And the red is the intraarterial and commonly intramural. This is the AAOLCA, the anomalous left coronary artery, the one that we are quite concerned about. And the anomalous right coronary is not shown in this illustration. Uh, as Dr. Jagatrisaran um, uh, said in her um, talk earlier, the prevalence ranges from 0.1 to 0.7% of the general population, but the prevalence depends on what modality you use to diagnose AOCA, and I've also found it depends on what you use to define AOCA. Anomalous right coronary artery is about three to six times more prevalent than anomalous left, but the risk of sudden death is much greater with anomalous left than anomalous right, and most common during or just after exercise. So then, you know, the purpose of this talk, you know, how do we evaluate these patients if we're gonna send them to surgery or for observation? You know, I think that this is a really difficult question. And as you know, there is controversy regarding surgical management, notably with asymptomatic intraarterial intramural anomalous right coronary artery. Our team at CHOP utilizes a management and evaluation algorithm that I will review for the remainder of these slides, which largely focuses on provocative studies. Anatomic features have certainly been of interest in risk stratification and continue to be of interest. Intramural length and its association with myocardial ischemia is one aspect that has been of interest in a study by Kashal and colleagues in 2011 found that symptoms were associated with intramural length, which certainly gave us pause. But in 2017, that same group published with a larger sample of patients and found no correlation with intramural length or osteal size and symptoms. In our recent study from the AOCA registry, we did find that intramural length with anomalous right coronary artery was associated with increased myocardial ischemia risk. However, I think before we utilize this as a sole reason for going to surgery, further investigation and close examination of our CT and MRI images is needed. At this time, our recommendation and evaluation for surgery is largely based on signs and symptoms, as well as results of provocative testing for anomalous right coronary artery. For anomalous left coronary artery, it is more straightforward in terms of surgical recommendations. Turning now to the evaluation and management decision-making algorithm, I want to take us back to our patients that I started with. So here we have the echo diagnosis of a probable anomalous coronary artery. We then are going to undergo a confirmatory test utilizing cardiac MRI or CTA. This is the first patient who had uh, symptoms with running with a likely anomalous right coronary, and you can see that the MRI confirmed that. We also utilize virtual angioscopy, which allows the observer to view the data as if you are standing inside the aorta and can view the aortic sinuses, the ostea, and the ST junction. You can see from this image that the right coronary artery ostea is very narrowed and slit, like you can't even open it up, as compared to the left coronary artery, which is nice and round. This is our patient B, the young man with the possible interarterial anomalous left coronary artery. As you can see, it does confirm, it does look like there's likely an intramural course as well. Patient C, this is the young lady with the possible intraseptal anomalous left. You can see here as we come around this single coronary trunk arising from the right sinus of Valsalva, then the right coronary rises normally, the left coronary goes intraseptally, courses through the conal septum, and emerges on the epicardial surface, where you'll see here where it bifurcates into the LAD and the circumflex coronary arteries. So now we have an, the confirmatory test, and if any patient who has documented ischemia, they are certainly gonna be sent for surgery. But the vast majority of our patients are asymptomatic 
or have symptoms without documented ischemia. And for this reason, we're going to go forward with provocative testing, which we use an exercise stress test with stress echo. And then many places are using stress MRI with sobutamine. We use bicycle MRI. And the reason this is so important is because, as was alluded to earlier, our patients are very unique in that their symptoms come forth with exercise and usually with pretty significant exertion. So this is the ischemia cascade. Ischemia occurs when myocardial oxygen demand exceeds myocardial blood supply. And from the earliest preclinical presentation here where it's clinically unrecognized unre all the way to a myocardial infarction, we can utilize imaging and it plays an important role. And you can see here the stress imaging that we want to use. We can use MRI, PET, SPECT, and ECHO uh, in a way for us to risk stratify our patients. We use cardiopulmonary exercise testing, as we said, for risk assessment. We use it with nuclear and stress echo. We also use it as a way to return to sport after surgery. And ischemia with exercise tests is identified with chest pain, but with kids, it's really important that the chest pain be associated with electrocardiographic changes or stress echo finding. Um, also, we might see complex ventricular arrhythmias, or we might see a decrease or no increase in the systolic blood pressure during exercise. So going back to our patient, patient B, the one with the interarterial, likely intramural anomalous left coronary, this was his baseline exercise EKG. And about six minutes into exercise, you can see he had about four to five millimeter inferolateral ST segment depression. He was asymptomatic though. Stress echocardiography is also utilized now a lot. Because false negative results are common with exercise testing alone, with EKG alone, we do recommend an imaging study along with the exercise test. So stress echo can be done using pharmacologic or exercise. Ischemia will be evidenced by new or worsened wall motion abnormality or reduced systolic wall thickening. So patient B, the shortening fraction did not augment with exercise. That was him at rest. Sorry, kind of cut off a little faster, but you can see does not augment with exercise. So once again, we consider this a positive stress test. So now that patient underwent provocative testing, had ischemia, and this patient was referred for surgery. The use of SPECT is also um, utilized by many people. However, Due to radiation exposure and false positives that we find, so on occasion we have found, let's say someone with an anomalous right coronary artery, but they have a perfusion defect in the LAD territory. So this is a false positive, and it, it makes it a little confusing for us. Certainly we don't send them to surgery with a false positive, but it's hard telling the families that and discussing that with them. So for these reasons, as well as the utility of stress echo and stress DMR, we are not using this as much in anomalous coronary artery, but we do still sometimes. Um, rest and stress images are obtained, and a perfusion defect is noted when the injured, diseased, or dead myocardial cells do not take up the radioisotope. And our patient A, that was the young man with the symptoms with the anomalous right coronary artery, we had done his testing about four or five years ago, and you can see here there was a reversible inferior basal perfusion defect. His EKG, his uh, exercise EKG was normal. So this young man, also was sent to surgery. Dobutamine stress MRI is now being utilized more and more. We don't do them here. Uh, we do utilize bike MRI. And since I did not have a positive bike MRI yet, I did show this, so thank you to Dr. Krishna Murthy. Um, this was a positive uh, test of mild inferoceptal reversible perfusion defect in a person with anomalous right coronary artery. Cardiac catheterization with IVIS. So, we don't utilize it much in the pediatric population. It certainly is utilized more in the adult population. However, some centers may utilize it, especially in those with intraceptal, intraconal anomalous left coronary artery who have symptoms to help with evaluation for surgery or for further management. A recent article by my friend and colleague, Dr. Malasi at Texas Children's Hospital showed this with 18 patients, so a small N, but they did show this all with patients with interceptal anomalous left coronary artery. About half were asymptomatic. The median age was 12. Perfusion imaging was performed in 14 and was abnormal in half of these. All four who had had symptoms and three who did not or had non-exertional symptoms had myocardial hypoperfusion noted on stress DMR. So while this is a busy slide, I do want to point out 
These are the ones with high risk features who were felt to be those with persistent symptoms or an abnormal stress CMR. All of those underwent cardiac catheterization with FFR using dobutamine and IFR. Positive results were an FFR less than 0.8 and an IFR of less than 0.9. Of these, four were restricted from exercise and given beta blockers. They did not go to surgery. One did undergo coronary artery bypass, but this patient also had severe LAD and proximal, sorry, proximal LAD stenosis and severe LCA stenosis. The short term, the follow-up is quite short term. I do think we need longer term follow-up in order to say that this is the correct way to manage these patients, but it is certainly an intriguing study. I certainly want to make sure to point out that in those who are asymptomatic with intraceptal anomalous left coronary artery and anomalous right coronary artery, which honestly is the vast majority of the patients that we see in our clinic, they would follow this pathway here. We would allow sports uh, with counseling. We have a lot of shared decision-making. We do recommend an AED be present at sporting competitions and practices. Um, and this is what patients see in my above case did. She went back to track and soccer and cross country and has been doing fine. She comes back for yearly uh, testing. In patients with intraarterial anomalous left coronary artery, even if asymptomatic, we do stress them, but we do recommend surgery between ages of five to 10 years. And then over on this right hand here, after surgery, three months after, we do recommend the same provocative testing that we did pre-surgery in order to clear them and allow them for sports participation. In our patient A with anomalous right coronary artery, he underwent unroofing and three months later had provocative testing, which was normal. We did an MRI that you can see here pre-surgery, this very slit-like opening, and then looking at virtual angioscopy, this nice round orifice postoperatively, and the right coronary artery arising from the correct sinus. So in summary, many challenges remain with patient evaluation and subsequent risk stratification with AOCA, notably with interarterial intramural anomalous right. Surgery is not always the answer for anomalous right, but is usually recommended for interarterial intramural left in the ages of five to 10 years. Intraseptal intraconal anomalous left is often benign, but close attention should be paid to concerning symptoms as further workup may be necessary. As we said earlier, more research and data are needed, especially with functional ischemia testing, to help us make the decision regarding surgery versus observation and collaboration between centers in North America and Europe um, remains essential and having meetings just as this is so important as there is still much to be learned about these patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia. It was, uh... Amazing, thanks a lot. Uh, I think that uh, we will have time uh, to discuss uh, and uh, there is the, the moment uh, with Anusha about the, the question and answer. So now we move uh, to Rakesh Krishnamurti. We still will talk about the goals or the importance of advanced imaging. Dr. Raj Krishnamurti is the radiologist in chief at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio and it is Professor of Radiology in the Ohio State University. It's our pleasure now to share your screen and welcome to Congenital Art Academy. Thank you very much. Let me get to my first slide. I'd like to thank the leadership of the Congenital Heart Academy for your kind invitation. So um, there is a big team that I have the privilege of working with that's um, been studying the cause of sudden death in anomalous coronary arteries. We've been engaged in uh, some 3D printing and flow modeling, looking at uh, the mechanism of sudden death. And I'd like to thank all my collaborators, especially Dr. Dasi at uh, the Department of Bioengineering at Georgia Tech, Dr. Malosi at Texas Children's, Dr. Mary at uh, Austin, and the surgeons and researchers at Congenital Heart Surgeon Society. It's important to remember what we are trying to do here. We are essentially trying to risk stratify and make a decision. And uh, these are the questions that matter. Who is at risk of sudden death? What is the relative risk of the right versus left? What are the morphologic factors associated with increased risk? How good is imaging? 
had the farming risk stratification? And then how do we decide on observation versus exercise restriction versus surgery? And what the long-term consequences of surgery versus exercise restriction are? And you've already heard some of these questions already being discussed here. And it's important to remember that imaging plays a small but important role in the workflow, which is done typically in a multidisciplinary environment. And you just saw the one that Dr. Brothers presented. This is the workflow that Texas Children's Hospital uses. And I'm sure that there may be a few variations of the theme, but the principles are similar. And it's important to remember that this kind of guidance evolves with time. And most of the time they are focused on high risk symptoms like exertional syncope is one, exertional dyspnea or high risk anatomy like the presence of a longer intramural course or osteostenosis. And um, sometimes they may be performed based on functional assessment like stress testing. And you notice that the performance of conventional uh, nuclear stress testing versus stress CMR versus exercise stress testing are not always concordant because of the high incidence of intermittent ischemia and the variable performance of each of these tests in a given setting. So <clears throat> what we do should never be looked at in a vacuum, especially if we belong to a imaging specialty or a if you're a cardiologist or if you're a surgeon, and it's, this is the perfect scenario for a multidisciplinary discussion, putting the data together and trying to figure out if a mechanism for ischemia exists in a given patient. So typically four mechanisms are considered to be in play. And a patient may have one or more of these. One is a crescentic osteal shape and dynamic stenosis. The second is the presence of an intramural course and when the aortic pressure increases, there is inner susception of the thin intimal wall into the lumen, causing narrowing. The third is aortic wall stretch in systole, especially in exercise that directly exacerbates the coronary hypoplasia. And finally, compression of the coronary artery between the pulmonary and aortic walls. So the goal of surgery would then be to relieve the mechanistic cause of ischemia in a given patient. And most of the time, we don't really know what that mechanism is. All we know is this patient has ischemia. And what we try to do then would be to resolve all of these. So you want the osteum to be placed in the right sinus, the intramural course to be completely resolved, the osteostenosis to be resolved, and the interarterial course to be resolved. And now that gives us some idea of what the imaging targets are. We want to know where the osteum is. What is the relationship to the Kamishura column? Is there an interarterial course? And then what is the osteal configuration? Is it stenotic, slit-like? Is there an intramural course? How long is it? Is there dynamic compression across the cardiac cycle? Is there an intramyocardial course? And then what is the end organ status? And the reason why I've highlighted these four things in red is because that allows us to look at performance of the two most commonly used advanced imaging modalities, MR and CT. MR, especially in the last few years, you can get pretty high resolution imaging of the intramural segment. You can get wall motion abnormalities, apical hypokinesis here, and you can get viability information. So it looks like a pretty nice modality that gives you different types of important and relevant information. But why do we still prefer CT to MR in this setting? That's a very important question. CT offers two things. One, it's the only modality that allows you high resolution three-dimensional imaging across the cardiac cycle. So I can go back and find a face in diastole. And you notice here the RCA looks pretty normal but the LCA is very small in diastole, which is why you expect the coronary to be larger. <clears throat> if I go back to that same data set and find a systolic phase, I notice that the LCA is actually arising exactly from the commissure between the left and non-coronary sinuses, and it fills only in systole. Now, CT is the only modality that can give you that information. 
The second thing about CT is its ability to distinguish between soft tissue versus fat and its ability to look at the wall of the aorta and the coronary artery directly. So the really dark thing here is fat. The gray is soft tissue. So this allows me to then look at intramural versus mediastinal segments of the coronary artery. And that's gonna be one of our important diagnostic features. So we compared these features in a small series in 2013 um, and we MR performed poorer for coronary osteo relationship, osteomorphology and intramural cores. So at that time we made a decision to go with CT as our standardized approach for looking at the anomalous coronary artery. Of course, MR techniques have improved since then, so the time is probably ripe to reassess that comparison once again. But regardless of what type of modality you're using, we should be following a structured interpretation template for assessing the anomalous coronary artery. You wanna comment on the type of anomalous coronary, the osteolocation location in the radial and vertical planes, the coronary dominance, osteal relationship, osteal morphology, intramural course in length, interarterial course in length, and then course to a thickened pillar and dynamic narrowing across the cardiac cycle. The CT protocol we use typically is a retrospective gated technique because we want to capture the coronary at different phases across the cardiac cycle. And we typically reconstruct 20 phases and then we perform 3D volume rendering and MIPS, including dynamic virtual angioscopy. This is the structured interpretation template we will take a closer look at. First, what is the type of anomalous coronary? One, it's a single coronary artery which branches outside the aortic wall in the mediastinum. And the coronary may or may not have an intramyocardial course or interceptal course. Second type is a right coronary artery arising from the left sinus with two separate ostia. And the third type is a left coronary artery arising from the right sinus. Again, two separate ostia. <clears throat> the second is osteomorphology. Is it round or oval, which are typically non-stenotic, or is it slit-like or pinhole? And CT, you can create virtual angioscopic views, which mimic surgical views pretty precisely. And um, you can then comment on the slit-like nature of the orifice, or a pinhole osteum, which is high-grade osteostenosis, like you see here, or an oval osteum of the contralateral coronary, which is non-stenotic. The third thing we talk about is where is the osteum located radially as well as vertically? And this is important because the osteum typically locates juxtacomishral or very close to the pillar. And uh, the approximately 25% of the location close to the pillar uh, is very important surgically from the middle location in the remainder of the sinus. So the right sinus is one, left sinus is two, non-sinus is typically three. And the juxtacommercial locations are called A and C, and the middle 50% of the sinus is term B. From a vertical standpoint, we make a distinction between an origin where the commish was, which is typically where the valves open and close, and the extension of that commissure superior to the sinotubular junction, which is called the column, pillar, or post. And then a location at the sinotubular junction, which is a common location for a lot of these anomalous coronaries, or a high origin, which is typically an origin from the ascending aorta. And those are term one to four, respectively. Obviously, if it's a one origin, then it's clearly gonna affect the surgical the surgical approach because you're allowed to take down the valve. The two location, if it's a high two, then you may be able to unroof it without disrupting the valve integrity. But if it's a low two, you'll still have to take down that valve. So from a nomenclature standpoint, so this is an example of a 1B for the right coronary artery. It's arising from the middle of the right sinus and a 1C for the left coronary artery which has got a juxter commish relocation arising from the right sinus. And then from a vertical standpoint, the right coronary is a two, while the left coronary arises from the sinotubular junction. So that's a three. 
The next thing we talk about is the relationship between the two osteo. Type one, it's two separate osteo. Two is adjacent. Three is a single osteum bifurcating in the wall of the aorta or a single osteum bifurcating outside the aortic wall. So these are some examples. These are two separate osteo, which you see on virtual angioscopy. These are two adjacent osteo, and the right has an intramural course in addition and has a slit-like orifice. Here, this is an example of a single common osteum, but the branching happens within the aortic wall. And you notice that this one has a common orifice on virtual angioscopy. And this is the anatomy here. And finally, you have the typical single coronary artery, which branches outside the aortic wall, as you see here. And this also has an interceptal course. As far as the aorta is concerned, it's still a single coronary artery that's branching outside the aortic wall. The next thing we comment on is intramurality. And we typically use two signs for diagnosing intramurality. One, we look for a complete pericoronary cuff of fat that typically is present in the mediastinum versus the inner wall being soft tissue density on CT. And there is a cuff of fat only outside on the outer wall. The second thing we look at is the shape of the coronary. The intramural coronary typically is oval in shape as opposed to the mediastinal segment of the coronary, which has a rounded shape. So in this case, we notice that the mediastinal fat looks very dark as opposed to the intimal wall, which has a grayish color. And this is the Hounsfield differences on CT between soft tissue versus fat. And we can use that the absence of a complete pericoronary cuff of fat is a sign of intramurality. And here there's a complete cuff of fat as a sign of mediastinal segment. And then we travel on the perpendicular plane where we see the cross section to the place where we see the full cuff of fat. And then we start from the ostium to that location to measure the intramural length. So let's take a look at this example. So this is a anomalous left coronary artery from the right coronary artery with adjacent ostia and a long intramural course of the left coronary artery which crosses the column as an additional cuff of soft tissue that you see here. There is no osteostenosis in this case. So we call this a 1B and a two, level two origin with two sub adjacent ostia with 11 millimeter intramural course crossing the column. That's pretty much the structured interpretation for this particular case. So we looked at an accuracy of CT and it has 100% accuracy for the type of coronary, 85 to 96% accuracy for osteostenosis, 92 to 98% for detection of intramurality and the intraclass correlation coefficient for intramural length range from 0.67 to 0.81 for three separate readers with varying levels of experience. This is by far the best performance for a non-invasive imaging modality that we could get in this setting. I'll just skip through this data here. The next thing we look at is post-operative imaging. I think CT has a very important role in assessing adequacy of surgery. And this is the preoperative image, anomalous right from the left crossing the column and this is after unroofing. And there are a few things we look for. One is the ostium coming from the appropriate sinus. Yes, in this case, it's coming from the right sinus. Two, is that intramural course completely resolved? And the answer is yes. Is the osteostenosis resolved? Is there any residual proximal narrowing? And the answer is yes and no. And finally, is the interarterial course resolved? And the answer to that is yes. So from a mechanistic standpoint, this is a successful surgery. And fortunately, there is quite a bit of variability. So our approach has been to move to the butamine stress MR in this setting. Uh, it's radiation-free alternative. Uh, we don't believe adenosine or regadenosine are appropriate in this, in this setting because of the dynamic nature of the narrowing and absence of fixed coronary stenosis. So the butamine, there are certain important differences from exercise, which is probably the ideal way to uh, create ischemic burden. Um, you typically have to combine the butamine with atropine to reach maximal heart rate. And even if you did, uh, you've noticed that the heart rate typically is higher with the butamine atropine combo than peak exercise, but the systolic blood pressure and rate pressure product are better or higher with peak exercise than at peak debutamine. 
Um, exercise treadmill MR is an option available in a few places, but uh, the butamine is probably something that can be performed in most locations. Uh, this is an example of a patient with an anomalous right coronary artery who demonstrated infraceptal uh, stress uh, hypo intensity, which was not present on the resting data. And this patient actually had a concordant nuclear study as well, an infraceptal reversible defect. So in conclusion, um, I cannot overstress the importance of a standardized imaging protocol for your given institution or at a registry level and a structured interpretation template of AAOCA. CT is probably the most accurate for the morphologic biomarkers that we consider as potential predictors of ischemia, including the length of intramurality and osteostenosis. Uh, the butamine stress MR or system maybe can be used for stratification, but we need more data to study this. And uh, there is a role for advanced imaging postoperatively, and that needs to become a standardized component. And there may be a role for IVAS FFR, as FFR changes have shown to be predictive, at least on the modeling standpoint. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Krishnamurti. Um, I think we're starting with our pool. Uh, Grace? Perfect. We are moving on to the poll. So the first question, I hope all of the audience can see these questions, is what are, the some, what are some of the potential complications of AAOCA repair? One, new aortic insufficiency. Two, abnormal ejection fraction. Three, new postoperative ischemia. Four, death. And five, all of the above. Please submit your answers now. Well done. So the correct answer is the last answer, which is all of the above, which 85% of you got. Thank you. You can definitely have all of these as complications following aortic, uh, anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery repair. Our next question submitted by Dr. Padalino is in Europe, we had evidence that surgical repair for AOCA was A, associated with low risk, B, was associated to improved greater return to sports activity, especially in more active and younger patients, C, all of the previous, and D, was associated with high postoperative mortality. And I believe the answer is C, uh, all of the previous, which 65% of you got. Again, this is not a surgery that's associated with high postoperative mortality. Um, it's generally associated with low risk, but does have a lot of associated complications or potentially higher than what we once thought. From Dr. Julie Brothers, all patients with suspected AAOCA should undergo further imaging, such as CTA or MRI, true or false. Correct, it's true that all patients should undergo further imaging with advanced techniques. Another question from Dr. Julie Brothers. Upon diagnosis of AAORCA or anomalous right, the patient should be referred to surgery, true or false? The 
The answer is false. Correct. From Dr. Krishnamurthy. The likely mechanisms for ischemia and AOCA include all of the following except the crescentic osteal shape and dynamic stenosis, aortic pressure collapses the thin walled lumen of the intramural segment of the proximal coronary, adjacent origins of the right and left coronary ostea within the aortic root, and compression along the interarterial course of the coronary artery between the aorta and pulmonary artery. So the answer is adjacent origins. Again, having an adjacent origin within the left, within the ostea do not really uh, imply a mechanism for ischemia. So another question from Dr. Krishnamurthy, CT is a superior cross-sectional imaging alternative to MRI for assessment of AAOCA because it provides simultaneous assessment of perfusion and viability, dynamic high-resolution 3D imaging of the proximal coronaries across the cardiac cycle, improved wall motion assessment of the LV, and a radiation-free alternative to imaging. So 89% of you got the answer right. It's a dynamic high resolution imaging of the proximal coronaries. Um, it's not radiation free, does not provide perfusion and viability or wall motion assessment. Alvise, there is some comment about the, the question. Um, are you okay? Uh, yeah, we have a few minutes. I think um, there were a lot of good questions that have been kind of already answered in the chat. Um, I had a couple of questions, I think, that were kind of interesting. One was on the utility of a CAP procedure in uh, uh, AACA repair. Uh, I, I think Dr. Uh, Jega and, and Dr. Padalino can probably address this aspect, like you know, when is, it is indicated and how is the competitive flow uh, playing a role in this uh, sense. And uh, to me, another very interesting question was on the dominance, like what, what, what is the, um, uh, the role of the dominance of the AALCA in the, uh, for indication for surgery? Uh, Anusha, can you start? discussing these two okay. aspects. So the first question was related to cabbage. In our cohort, we had very few patients who underwent cabbage. And really, I think this is not a, a technique that's really utilized in the pediatric population, often because you do, you are faced, because of the dynamic nature of ischemia with ligating the, the native coronary in order to avoid competitive flow. And I think most surgeons would be highly uncomfortable with doing that. Um, I think in the setting of an adult patient where they may have concomitant coronary artery disease, this is a much more palatable option. So that would kind of be my thoughts regarding the first question. The second question regarding, um, Alvisa, can you tell me what it is again? Yeah, it was about the dominance. He, they were asking, like, I, I think it's, it's an aspect that hasn't been really studied, uh, but, uh, I think it's a good concept, like, uh, what is the, the role of the dominance of the anomalous particle artery in, for the indication to surgery? Yeah, so this, um, again, it's something we've talked about a lot as we adjudicated patients for the CHSO study. I think when you wanna really be careful about dominance is looking at what the coronary territory is that has a perfusion defect. So especially you wanna notice this or any distal sort of segments that are towards the apex, which coronary is dominant in terms of which one's anomalous. You wanna make sure that the territory matches. And Julie, do you have any further thoughts on that that you might wanna share with us? I mean, I think that's my perspective on when we wanna look at that. 
territory and not Yeah, um, we don't necessarily use it for surgical recommendations, but that being said, we, if we have a patient with anomalous right coronary artery who is left dominant, which is certainly much more rare, but we, we see it, I think we all feel a little more comfortable just because, you know, the uh, myocardium that's perfused by the anomalous vessel is, is quite small. Um, yeah, and also it's important to know when you have, this actually just recently came up, when we had a positive perfusion study, actually a positive stress echo, and then we looked closely and we said, wait, it's a, a dominant left, and so this is actually a false positive study, and so it was very helpful because actually this patient we were considering sending for surgery because she had some vague symptoms, which but you, know, you put that together, the positive study, oh, she should go to surgery, but we were actually able to say, no, it's that was false positive. So it can be helpful. I wouldn't use it to send to surgery or not, though. Thank you, Judy. I also have two quick questions for uh, Dr. Krishnamurti. I think um, uh, we, we will probably, like, uh, according to the questions you receive for, you know, specific patients from people, I, th I think we really need to stress the importance of having forums, what we, uh, what Anusha is trying to, to have with uh, all of you, like for people, you know, to refer uh, kind of your patients to the, the expert. And, uh, and also, as you were mentioning, like having uh, common definitions um, for imaging and for, like, you know, surgery. So if you can uh, briefly discuss on the importance of these things. Right. I think um, one of the challenges that any registry will face, and I'm sure Massimo and Usha recognize this really well, um, is terminology. Are we all saying the same thing and meaning the same thing when the imaging report or the surgical report is describing certain findings like a course through a column or course through the commissure? Uh, I think they mean different things um, because and if it's going through the column, is it going through the column very close to the sinotubular junction? Or is it actually going through a low two, level two? Uh, and that makes a huge difference to surgical approach. Um, same with high origin. Is it really coming from the ascending aorta or is it at the sinotubular junction? And when you talk about um, um, intramural length, how was it exactly measured during surgery? Um, we spent a lot of time um, at Texas Children's when we did that study where we used a thread to actually uh, create a suture, mark the, uh, on the intimal side, the uh, emergence of the coronary artery from the wall. And then we used a thread to measure the intramural length during surgery. And, um, and that is very slightly different from actually eyeballing it or using a scale without precisely marking that emergence of the coronary artery from the wall. So, um, I think there are some recommendations that are coming out, hopefully, which um, uh, will provide precision. And I encourage everybody to be consistent in the way we do this, uh, because we absolutely need these registries to make sense of this condition. Thank you very much. So now we can uh, move uh, to the next, uh, to the second part of the, this uh, amazing meeting. And then we move to one of our friends, Professor Olivera Ski, who is the head of pediatric cardiac surgery at Hospital Necker and Fan Malad in uh, University of Paris, Professor University of Paris. The, the title of his lecture is uh, The Goals and Outcome of Anatomical Repair. Thanks, uh, Olivier. Thank you, Sasha, for this invitation. It's a pleasure for me to share my experience and our surgical experience in, in uh, Paris. I would like to remind you that it's, I mean, surgery is definitely not the only option for this patient because the morbidity uh, for this operation is far from nothing. I have no disclosure. So there are many, uh, as we already seen before, different anatomic situation when both coronaries arise from the same sinus. And, of course, some of these patterns are not a risky situation, but when the uh, abnormalous coronary comes uh, between the two uh, vessels, then we know that the risk is higher, especially if there is an intramural course. The sudden cardiac death 
uh, is associated definitely with this interarterial uh, course of the right coronary or the left coronary with or without uh, intramural course. And in some very rare cases, when there is an intraceptal or intracranial course of the left coronary artery. The goal of a surgery is definitely to obtain for me a postoperative anatomy, which is as close as possible to the normal anatomy. I definitely, we need at least to treat the interarterial and the intramural course of the abnormal coronary. If you look at the mechanism of a sudden cardiac death, one can see here of this specimen that on a cross-sectional view that there is really a narrowed lumen of the right coronary in, uh, in the uh, intramural segment. So we will have during surgery to address that uh, specific lesion. But this is probably not the uh, only uh, uh, anatomy that lead to a sudden cardiac death. Uh, the slit-like osseum, like we have described on CT scan, the transcommissural course, the acute angle of takeoff, less than 30, 40 degrees, the anomalous site of takeoff, and sometimes for older patients, the hypoplasia of the initial segment after takeoff, or some combined atherosclerosis lesions, will need to be addressed at the same time during surgery to avoid myocardial ischemia at stress. There, I mean, when we are speaking about surgery, everything, everybody thinks about unroofing, which treats perfectly probably the entire arterial course, the intramural course, but still uh, this surgery doesn't treat the acute angle of takeoff, the anomalous site of takeoff and some lesion in the initial segment of the coronary artery. Let's speak now about surgical treatment. We have the indirect treatment and direct treatment. Indirect means that we are not going to touch the uh, anomalous coronary here. It means that uh, this treatment, indirect treatment, can be applied only when there is an interarterial course, which is probably less than 30% of the cases. Because if there is an intramural course of, us, of the coronary, then we will have to address this uh, lesion too. And we know that the intramural segment is most of the time stenotic at the level of the commissure of the aortic valve. The indirect surgical, uh, surgical treatment is probably a procedure that we can add to over procedure in order to uh, not uh, have that compression between the two vessels and we can I mean, uh, use the lateral translocation, I mean, do an anastomosis between the main PA to the left PA, or do like a Leconte maneuver, an anterior translocation of the PA. The surgical treatment can be direct. It means that uh, you are going to treat the, at least the anterior arterial course uh, of, the, of the anomalous coronary. Here, a direct reimplantation of the left coronary artery, which is going to, meet, to be mobilized and reimplanted at the appropriate and appropriate level and appropriate sinus. But I mean, this reimplantation, it's not so easy. Here, a, a patient that we received from another hospital and that had, we, uh, who had a, a right coronary reimplantation, and one can see that there is a kink of a right coronary because there is an excess length of tissue and I mean they should have uh, reduced the length of that coronary or choose a different spot uh, for reimplantation. The direct surgical treatment uh, I mean needs to be applied for all coronaries when there is an intramural course uh, of the abnormal coronary. The unroofing is probably the most used technique in the world and the most popular uh, it consists of a uh, uh, roof resection of the uh, intramural course of the coronary. But of course, when you do that resection, you will have to deal uh, when the coronary is a bit uh, close to the root of the aorta, close to the aortic valve, you will have to deal with the commissure of the aorta. And this is why uh, some uh, uh, team have described the partial unroofing, it means that you are going to avoid that uh, 
that uh, region in order to create a neo-ostium uh, in the appropriate sinus. But to be honest, this is not such an easy operation. It's quite easy not to be dangerous, but it's quite difficult to be effective. Why? Because the resection of the intramural course of the coronary is difficult. If you go too far, then you will have an injury here uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the level of the takeoff of the coronary. So you can very easily have a persistence of uh, an intramural segment. And at the same time, if you have a very uh, acute takeoff of the coronary, you won't treat uh, that lesion at the same time of the unroofing. This is why, it, um, I mean, residual coronary ischemia has been described as up as uh, uh, 35 percent uh, 35 in some series, um, telling us that uh, finally this uh, uh, operation is quite safe, but is uh, not effective all the time. This is probably why Tom Carl uh, has described in 2008 uh, the physiologic repair, which consists of a, a full uh, opening of the intramural course of the coronary. Then you are going to do a, a patch angioplasty of this uh, coronary, but because you let the coronary between the two vessels, he had some indirect uh, treatment of the lesion by, uh, uh, by a translocation of a main PA to the left pulmonary artery. Some other uh, uh, team who were completely, uh, uh, um, uh, who were uh, uh, very, um, um, I mean, they, they, they were knowing that the unroofing alone is not uh, always effective. They uh, propose to uh, use the unroofing, which consists to reject the uh, intramural segment, but add some uh, uh, unflooring of the of the os of the neo ostia in, in order to have a, a neo ostia which is very large. At Necker, uh, we have um, this idea that unroofing can be quite a safe operation, but. Uh, we, uh, is not always effective because it doesn't treat all these uh, different uh, fine elements, which is the, uh, the anomaly of the osseum, the acute angle of takeoff, the anomalous site of takeoff, and sometimes, especially for the right coronary artery with older patients, the hypoplasia of the initial segment, I'm, I'm saying about uh, the first millimeter after takeoff, and sometimes uh, after the age of 20, 30, uh, some combined atherosclerosis lesion just at the level of takeoff. Our experience comes from uh, what we have been using for years for the surgical treatment of coronary stenosis after arterial switch. The idea was to uh, do an angioplasty of the initial segment of the stenosis Coronary, uh, uh, coronary uh, artery after a uh, switch. And, and finally, we had uh, the idea to apply that technique for anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery. So the idea is not to treat uh, the intramural segment itself, itself, not to damage the aortic valve, and to create an incision and a neo-ostia in uh, the appropriate sinus here, this is the left coronary artery. So here it is the uh, surgery, a video for uh, the surgeon. So we start with retrieving a very thin piece of pericard, fresh pericardium. Here I see, you can see the right coronary. Here it is, this is the left coronary, which is in tremor, in tremor. Uh, we start with a full uh, division of the artery in order to visualize perfectly the left coronary. We open vertically a little bit the aortic root and then open the left man and join the two opening. Then here, yeah, we want to open a little bit. You can sometimes divide the pulmonary artery in order to have a perfect uh, vision. We don't uh, open the intramural segment not to damage the commissure of the aortic valve. Then you do a resection a little bit of the uh, portion of the artery between 
uh, your two incision, and then you are going to make a neo-ostia with a piece of fresh uh, autologous pericardium. Uh, years after years, we have tried to minimize uh, the length and the size of this uh, uh, pericardium in order uh, not to have any uh, calcification uh, later or even plication of this patch. And nowadays, we keep a ring of native Arctic uh, wall at the top of this incision. And then the outer is closed. And we might see at the end the final, but better than uh, this movie. Uh, let's see what we can see on a CT scan, which is always done after surgery. This is the initial lesion of the left coronary artery coming from the right sinus. And you can see here that it's uh, uh, in a, a normal position now. And it, here it is a 3D reconstruction with the neo-ostia here and the intramural uh, corks, uh, which is let in place not to damage the arctic valve. Here it is an LAD. Uh, there was a cirque coming from the right coronary and an LAD, uh, which originates from the um, right sinus that has been operated uh, two uh, weeks ago. You can see that we have uh, dramatically reduced the size of the patch now in order to have almost a normal uh, anatomy. Here it is a right coronary reimplantation plus osteoplasty. So I'm going to stop again, look at this right coronary, the head of the patient is here. One can see, because I have fully mobilized this coronary to show you, you can see that if you just do an unroofing of the intramural segment of a coronary, you will keep uh, this very uh, acute angle of takeoff of a coronary. You will uh, keep uh, the anomalous uh, origin of the ostia. And sometimes you have a uh, uh, some hypoplastic segment here of the right coronary and some lesion that comes, atherosclerotic lesion that comes very early in the life of the patient. So the idea here is to relocate uh, the uh, ostia here. So we transect uh, the abnormalous coronary artery, close the uh, takeoff, and then we are going to reconstruct uh, autologous and autologous posterior wall of this coronary. And the main difficulty of this operation is to choose the perfect spot of the uh, reimplanted coronary. So here it is, we suture the uh, posterior wall of the coronary. You can open this coronary as far as you want uh, to cross the hypoplastic segment. And then you are going to reconstruct a neo-ostia with a very uh, small piece of fresh autologous pericardium. We finish uh, to reconstruct this uh, ostia, and then you, uh, you are going to see that after uh, cross clump off, you, we can see a perfect perfusion of this coronary, which is really very close to a normal anatomy, nothing to what we could have achieved with uh, just by unroofing uh, this uh, uh, coronary. But one can uh, understand very clearly that it's more difficult to do, probably. Uh, in our philosophy of uh, uh, anatomic repair, here it is a a conal course of the left coronary artery very quickly because it's going to be uh, exposed by my colleague later. Here it is, we have divided the artery and uh, the left uh, and the main pulmonary artery. Here it is the right coronary artery. We are going to see now uh, the, uh, the uh, intraconal uh, artery. I don't say intraseptal because the septal the septum is really, uh, the outlet septum is really small in a normal heart. Then we are going to completely uh, divide and mobilize uh, the um, uh, pulmonary root like we do for Ross procedure. Then the left uh, coronary artery is completely uh, uh, um, relieved from uh, the muscle. 
and we can uh, extensively mobilize the, uh, that coronary. When it's completely free, we are going to reconstruct the right ventricular outflow tract by uh, putting a small patch uh, at the posterior uh, rim of the uh, outflow tract. And then after reconstructing this posterior wall, we are going to reattach the uh, pulmonary uh, root uh, in order to have the left coronary at the appropriate uh, situation uh, outside of the heart and without any potential compression of the uh, muscle. This is a very rare situation because most of these patients are, are absolutely uh, not symptomatic, but this patient had a, an ab aborted uh, sudden cardiac death. Uh, here it is the experience from uh, Paris. About uh, 50 patients has been operated between 2000 and 2005, sorry, and 2019. Uh, the follow-up is only four years, and it was about two-thirds of right coronary artery. Uh, the mean age was 14 uh, years and about 80% uh, of the uh, patients were uh, with symptoms. Um, a third had a sudden uh, cardiac death and uh, about 20% uh, had no symptoms. Most of the left coronary or almost left coronary were treated by osteoplasty like you have seen of the movie. And for right coronary, it was uh, uh, split between a direct reimplantation and direct reimplantation with osteoplasty. Uh, there was no mortality, but uh, there was significant reintervention of this uh, uh, patient. And at last, for, that I will describe later. And at last follow up, about 90% of the patients were totally asymptomatic. And five out of the seven symptomatic patients had normal ischemic test and CT scan. One uh, patient. Uh, had a thrombosis of a tiny reimplanted uh, right coronary, and now uh, we are extremely uh, careful with this technique of reimplantation and osteoplasty not to treat very young patients with very tiny right coronary because it's, it is just technically too difficult uh, to do. So, a better selection can probably avoid uh, this uh, complication in our early experience. Two patients uh, has been reoperated or, 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 or stented for uh, uh, plication of the um, uh, anatomic repair of a left coronary artery. And in both uh, cases, they had a too long patch with some degree of plication of this patch. And really it was uh, in, in initial uh, uh, experience of this, uh, of this technique and, and of course, uh, a technical issue that is probably linked to our learning curve. If uh, we compare this result to this, uh, the other result of unroofing, we can see that the mortality is quite the same in uh, all the series, very low. But I mean, the morbidity is quite half whatever the technique has been used. Reoperation is 7%, aortic regurgitation 7%, new uh, ventricular dysfunction 2%, ischemia 6%, and sometimes even death. So whatever your technique you use, you have to take into consideration the risk of sudden death and the risk benefit, benefit ratio of surgical treatment. And I would like uh, to remind you that, uh, I mean, the previous speakers perfectly exposed what they have published before, but you have to do 10 flawless and perfectly protective operation on the left coronary artery uh, to be better than uh, the natural history of this patient. But on the right coronary, if they are not, uh, 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 if they have just a right coronary, uh, which is abnormal, uh, you have to do 250 flawless operation with a perfectly protective operation. And to be honest, this is more than difficult to achieve. So our decision now uh, in the unit uh, with this anatomic repair is to operate all the left coronary artery with or without symptoms, to operate all the right coronary artery uh, which are uh, symptomatic. But for the one who want to do uh, a sport at a high level 
and without any uh, ischemic tears. We are uh, more conservative and we want to take our decision about uh, on minor elements of anatomy, like it has been described before on the CT scan, which is the angle of takeoff, the site of the ostia, the initial diameter um, of uh, after takeoff. And this can lead us to, to do surgery for right coronary, uh, uh, anomalous right coronary artery, even uh, in, in the absence of, of ischemic sign when, when they want to um, uh, do uh, some uh, sport. I would say that in conclusion, osteoplasty is a, uh, an alternative to address all the anatomic features and try to be perfectly protective, which I think the unroofing cannot uh, give. It's definitely a more demanding and a more risky operation, especially uh, during the learning curve, because it's more difficult to do than a, an unroofing. But I have a deep feeling that it would be more protective if it's not too dangerous. And probably, I mean, uh, in a subgroup of patients like tiny bright coronary uh, and small children, I mean, there is a place for other technique like, like these, the unroofing. So I don't want to say to you that osteoplasty with or, or without reimplantation is the only technique. It is not a one-way streak and probably uh, knowing uh, uh, better the future of this patient and the, the um, uh, significant risk of uh, any anatomy, we will be able to choose between the two techniques. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Reisky. Um, for our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hani Najim from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he's the chief of cardiovascular surgery there and trained in Toronto following which he worked in Saudi Arabia prior to being recruited to the Cleveland Clinic. Um, it's a great to have him here and he's going to be talking about a strategy for repair uh, for transconal coronaries or intraseptal coronaries who are undergoing transconal repair. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Anusha. It's delighted to be among this group and uh, discussing an important, uh, really uh, congenital anomaly that uh, we're still learning a lot about and trying to figure out what is the best way we can go forward uh, with this, uh, with this uh, anatomy. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk about the transconal repair, when and how, uh, and I would like to, before we start, is to, uh, we have to, uh, agree as a group, as, uh, as a community, and on how we call these, pa these patients. So I think we should describe the anatomy as a transeptal course, and the procedure is a transconal repair, since the, the artery does not, it runs in the septum, which is obviously part of the conus, but it is not the entire conus. So I think just to be consistent with how we describe the anomaly, so we, we we, 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 we are reproducible on how we can uh, talk about it. So um, this is, uh, it is actually quite rare. We've seen that. We've, I don't wanna really repeat a lot of what has been said. And we have published uh, this now two years ago on how we do the transconal repair of unroofing of this, uh, which was uh, the very first <coughs> uh, publication on this technique. Uh, so the, the, the traditional, what really came out to me was when I was looking at these uh, CAT scan, you would see here that uh, the uh, anomalous left coronary is actually running in the septum, but it is actually bulging. So it is, you could see it, it's bulging in the right ventricular outflow tract. And I thought this is probably the longest uh, intramyocardial or myocardial bridge that you could have. The traditional surgery has been a bypass surgery, which unfortunately, as we've discussed and you've seen from the chat on the side, that really it does not work because of competitive flow. And the reality is you may get a, if you put a, an arterial graft, you're gonna get a string sign. And if you put a venous graft, it may thrombose because of the competitive flow from the native vessel and only becomes important when uh, the, uh, there's activity. 
so we've published this paper and I'll show you some of the, the, the uh, images. You've seen a lot of these images now repeatedly, so I'm not gonna talk too much about them since you do uh, have seen them so we don't waste time. So this is what we have published uh, and this the drawing of, of the procedure. So uh, in this procedure, this is where the, right, the lift coronary, which is the longest lift coronary you could have and the longest myocardial bridge that can happen which comes out of the right and then crosses and uh, until it's laterally and then it divides in an LAD. We do not divide the MPA because you really don't need to do that. And then we just follow the vessel all the way till laterally. And then what I find the most important part is to really dissect all the fibrotic and adventitial attachments, spe specifically at the beginning of the origin of the left main. And, and as we free this part up, what happens, it actually bulges out. And I do give frequent doses of cardioplegia to see exactly where the branches are. And there might be some septal branches coming out this way. I don't worry about the superior branches because they're going to a very small area of muscle that is not of any consequence. The ones, the septal zones are important. It is very important to preserve all these septal branches that they come out from the inferior aspect. And then as opposed to uh, 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 Dr. Uh, um, Reisky's uh, technique that has uh, uh, um, mimicked this, I actually take the patch all the way around to the anterior. And the reason for that, if, if, I, if we stop here, you're gonna still have an, an area where you can get some stenosis at the exit side of the left main. So the patch actually goes all around, all around the uh, corners of the uh, RV outflow track. This is how it looks, and this is it. And I'm going to just show anomalous origin of left coronary artery. From I don't know if you can hear this or not. Which arises from Maybe the not. right sinus and traverses the interventricular septum, causes ischemic. Uh, can you insertion. hear this or not? Coronary yeah, artery bypass graft well. fails with right ventricular outflow tract elongation. This 3D reconstruction of the anomalous left coronary artery arising from the right coronary sinus clearly shows the transeptal course of the left main coronary artery, which runs behind the right ventricular outflow tract. And as usual, you would see a bulge in the posterior right ventricular outflow tract indicating where the course of the left main coronary artery runs. The initial dissection is carried out prior to the initiation of cardiopulmonary bypass, where the plane between the aorta and the pulmonary artery is developed. At this point, the right ventricular outflow tract is divided anteriorly in order to expose the left coronary artery as it dives down into the septum. For precision and accuracy, a cross clamp is applied and the heart is arrested for the subsequent unroofing of the left coronary artery. You could see here the muscle overlying the left coronary artery is very sharply divided all the way across the and it divides into the LAD and circumflex. was started with a sharp scissor, then subsequently with a knife in order to clear the entire fibrous ridges that crosses the left main as it traverses the septum. Just prior to reconstruction, hemostasis is secured by giving further doses of cardioplegia to make sure that static and the coronary artery is intact. A long, generous, rectangular piece of autologous pericardium is harvested 
for reconstruction and elongation of as you could see reconstruction starts off with suturing this pericardium just below the pulmonary valve as well as the pulmonary valve but at the same time elongating the posterior aspect of the right ventricular outflow tract it, between the pericardium and the posterior surface of the right ventricular outflow tract and at this point it is important to take these bites carefully not to interfere with the septal branches of the left main coronary artery if there are any as we complete the suture line anteriorly the right ventricular outflow tract can be sutured primarily together without the use of the patch since we do not need any further elongation in this part of the right ventricular completed reconstruction of the right ventricular outflow tract with a clear expansion posteriorly of the RVOT and the complete unroofing of the left main which runs in a tunnel devoid of muscle as well as fibrous tissue. In this 3D reconstruction artery course. So this is uh, the uh, the technique that uh, we, we, we've, uh, we've uh, uh, reported. So uh, it is important that some of the, uh, uh, for my surgical co uh, colleagues, uh, repeated administration of cardioplegia, that really helps to define the anatomy. Dissection of all the fibrous tissue is really important. I don't think it's only unroofing with the muscle. I think all the fibrous tissue should be divided. And also uh, the tapering of the rectangular patch anteriorly. This is a post-operative TEE actually, which shows a, a very nice tunnel for that. And we've seen, showed you the, the space that we've created around the left main posterior to the right ventricular outflow tract. More importantly, it is obviously an autologous pericardial patch, so it's non-contractile with a lot of space, so it is not going to uh, cause any compression. So very quickly on the results, we've had nine patients since then. We've had two more, median age of 47. Uh, they had the transeptal course con uh, confirmed by uh, CTA. Three patients had non-invasive provocative testing and six patients underwent cardiac catheterization with intravascular ultrasound and IFRs. And we can discuss who should get this. And we are still in the learning process as to what is the best way to investigate these patients and also predict their outcome later on. Uh, five patients had negative provocative uh, non-invasive testing for ischemia. And the decision was based on the symptoms and a positive IFR. Uh, so it is important to realize that they are heterogeneous of a group of patients. Uh, this is just an example of how the IFR would be positive between the rest and, uh, and uh, provocations. And that's why uh, we've ended up with uh, operating on those uh, patients. This is a, a summary of those group uh, of patients ranging from age from 12 years of age up to uh, uh, 62 years of age. A couple of them have had previous bypass grafts who have uh, got occluded. So this patient had bypass grafts, Lima to LAD and softness brain grafts. Both of them went down uh, and that's why they became symptomatic again. There's another one here who also became, had a previous bypass surgery that went down. So that's why bypass surgery does not work for those patients. We know also uh, that uh, competitive flow will take over with these. A lot of them had either typical or atypical chest pain, and that's why they got investigated. And we are now starting to do IFRs in all of them if, uh, if we believe that this is important. I think as a community, we need to decide what is the best way of going forward. Is it the, uh, uh, is it the MRI? Is it the IFR uh, or, or a combination of both? And we also have been following them uh, up post-operatively if they have, if, we, if, if they agree to a, a, an invasive testing. Uh, the post-operative outcome has been great. Their uh, length of stay is, is, is very short. Uh, we've had no complications whatsoever with the, 
uh, with their hospital stay. And for those who have agreed to do a late IFR, they've all have improved and the IFRs, their IFRs have normalized post-operative. Post so in three patients, preoperative functional testing with non-invasive imaging was negative. Uh, despite that, they had uh, significant symptoms. The parents or the patients did not want to actually sit on that and, they, and we ended up operating. They had positive IFRs in all these patients. So it is important that even though that the provocative non-invasive testing could be negative, you could uh, have actually a positive IFR. And, uh, and others, uh, uh, this may be complicated by the presence also of other cardiac lesions. And I think it's really important. We've, we found one patient whom we have operated based on a positive perfusion scan and a positive, obviously, uh, uh, anatomy with a CT scan that uh, did not have an angiogram, but eventually uh, presented later on with an, a, a myocardial bridge in the LAD itself that hasn't been seen initially by the original CT scan. And I think it is important to realize when you have um, uh, stenosis in tandem, just like what we see in valves, you may not be able to see the second stenosis if it is there. So maybe an angiogram is indicated in all these patients. So what we typically like to do is we like to uh, confirm the anatomy and we like to have at least two functional tests to corroborate itself, either a non-invasive, one of those, either a, a stress PET, a debutamine echo, or a stress MRI. And then we would like to do some invasive testing. And this is in an effort to really understand what is happening. And post-operatively, we would like to do a surveillance on them, at least with one test that was positive before we want to establish that they're negative so we can uh, take it forward. Uh, and this is an algorithm for that. So in conclusion, transcolon on roofing uh, with posterior extension of the right ventricular outflow tract is an effective surgical technique for challenging anatomy uh, the entity. And we have great results with that. And I, I believe that any surgery for um, uh, intramural coronary, for transeptal coronary, whatever that anatomy is, it's got to have an outstanding outcome. I'm not sure we should be accepting actually a, a a mortality of one or two percent because the denominator sometimes is not is we don't know we don't know that these patients will have a sudden cardiac death so uh, uh, more understanding we of uh, who should be operated and and how do we follow them is very important uh, i believe we believe at the Cleveland clinic that we need to do a multi-modality provocative testing so we do not depend on one anatomy and one test to do this to corroborate and uh, help us understand which is the most appropriate test. Also, we believe that IVAS with IFR is an important component to confirm the diagnosis and can be used for objective surveillance post-operative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Heine. It was a very nice talk. And uh, now we are happy to uh, ask for Dr. Uh, Mauro Lorito to start his presentation about biomechanical modeling for patient outcome prediction. He is a consultant in congenital cardiac surgery at Policlinica San Donato in Milan, Italy, and a deputy statistical editor for the Junior of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Mauro. Thank you, um, Grace. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Congenital Heart Academy to invite me in this great session. And uh, I would like to go through something that has been uh, quoted a couple of times in the past talk about biomechanical modeling to understand if it's possible to improve patient risk stratification and possible um, uh, define a patient outcome. I have to say uh, that biomechanical modeling is, is starting into coronary anomalies. So I will not provide all the answer in this, uh, in this talk, but I will try to give you a feedback of, of where we are now. Um, I have no disclosure, but as says, there is a, a, a difficulty to risk stratify those patients. And this is part of the discussion. As uh, Dr. Uh, Najim said, we should not accept any mortality on those patients because we do not know if actually happen a, 
uh, an adverse event. So we are doing sometimes a preventive surgery for a high risk profile, but we don't know if this event will happen. Is because, as uh, discussed previously, several tests has uh, shown to be unable to replicate the physical effort uh, that occurs during the uh, surgical activity, uh, sorry, the sport activity causing sudden cardiac death. An indication to surgery in some cases are mainly only in anatomical characteristics that are being defined as high risk. And as uh, talked by Anusha and the previous speaker, the surgical treatment has low operative mortality, but maintain a burden of ischemia, sudden death, and need of reoperation. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, just to give a feedback, uh, stress ACG is not anymore in the guidelines as a test to detect a coronary artery disease in an acquired um, uh, population. And then it remains as indication only when other non-invasive imaging is not available, meaning we have to promote the use of uh, uh, stress MRI, uh, echo stress to detect which patient has or has not inducible ischemia, as shown by Dr. Morosi in the recent ABSO presented at American Heart Association, in which they show that a maximum effort stress does not agree with perfusion MRI and stress MRI. And then uh, the stress test should not be used alone to detect inducible ischemia and drive our decision uh, about the treatment. So how we can reduce uncertainty to define which patient requires surgery and which is safe to stay on follow-up and practice sport? Well, we might improve uh, test sensibility to detect induced ischemia or we may develop a new diagnostic methodology. Both of the approach we choose to follow, we have to be able to replicate and assess the ischemic mechanism and condition behind the event for each patient, because as we learn uh, through the time, each patient has a different trigger. They might be common for the same aspect, but each one is a little bit different. So biomechanical model and simulation might help in this, uh, in this uh, scenario. For the one who are not aware of what we talk, what we talk when we speak about model simulation, is actually a, a model designed by engineers that replicates uh, an object. It can be the aorta, can be a car, and then uh, the system applies forces and understand how the the design react to the forces, following some rules that we have to know upfront. And what we have done, we create an aortic root with the coronaries, and we want to assess if behave with the similar pathogenetic mechanisms that we thought is behind the sudden cardiac death event in the patient with anomalous aortic coronary of the coronary artery. And as well, we want to see if our uh, theoretical model is able to, to define the coronary dimension changes uh, during some uh, efforts. Uh, and of course, we move to a clinical um, evaluation if it works in a, in a clinical environment. This is our model. And this video, you can see we can select each type of anatomy or position of the coronary in the entire root of the aorta. We can also select penetration so we can design a, speci a specific model for, for each single patient. And the accuracy between the model uh, design in red compared to the the actual reconstruction of the patient is pretty good, meaning the model, uh, although is theoretically designed, it resembles the anatomy of the patient when we populate it with the parameters we retrieve from the CT scan. We test the theoretical model with different conditions, takeoff angle, intramural penetration, and aortic loading pressure to see if it behaves like the uh, pathogenetic mechanism. And we see that the normal coronary artery cross-sectional area in the vertical axis uh, and measure across the entire length of the coronary on the horizontal axis. When we uh, experience higher uh, pressure in the system, uh, simulating the effort, the coronary uh, dilated his lumen to, to, to respond to the pressure increase. This not happened for the anomalous coronary artery that we modeled theoretically with a takeoff angle of uh, 35 degree and an uh, intramural segment uh, that show a smaller dilatation, meaning kind of 
compression process. Then uh, in the model, we also look if it was able to replicate on another high risk features of the, of the anomalous aortic origin, that is the coronary uh, ostium size, dimension and distortion. As the greater was the takeoff angle, the, the higher is the eccentricity of the ostium. As well, it changes when we increase pressure. So we were pretty happy that this theoretical model was, was resembling what we believe uh, uh, is the pathogenetic mechanism. We then um, made a clinical validation in a pilot study that was done a couple of years ago and presented at the AATS and accepted for publication in JCTVS in 2020. We had uh, uh, five patients with anomalous aortic origin versus five controls. We retrieved the 25 parameters needed to, to populate the model. And we tested different loading condition from uh, a basal condition of the aortic root with 80 millimeter of mercury. We added 40 millimeter on the top of it and 100. And we measured the coronary artery. And the population has a different pattern of anomalous aortic origin. Three of them had chest pain during effort and one during stress test and present all of them except one uh, intramural segment and uh, all of them had a slit like osteo. About these uh, five patients, three received surgery and two were left uh, with a, a medical observation and competitive sport restriction. Mm, as a rule in Italy, those who does not receive surgery, uh, are not allowed to return to sport activity. Also, if there are uh, no evidence of ischemia. The, the behavior of the right coronary artery anomalous in our population was uh, pretty interesting in our modeling. In the vertical axis, again, you see the cross-section area of the coronary and on the horizontal axis is the length of the coronary from the ostium to the distal part. Each box represents one of the five patients, and the black line is the basal dimension of the coronary artery, and the blue line is the one that has been increased by 40 millimeter of mercury, and the red one by 100. And as you can see, there is no uh, expansion of the coronary artery in the initial segment that uh, has been defined by the CT as intramural, except for the one who has a very short uh, part of the intramural uh, segment, probably a couple of millimeters that was not significant. This was completely different from the right coronary artery that was simulated in the healthy controls that actually uh, show some increase of size in terms of caliber when we um, apply uh, increased uh, pressure loads. In terms of dimension, uh, the anomalous aortic origin had an average basal uh, cross-section area of six millimeters square that uh, increased to 6.2 and 6.3 at the two different loading condition. And this in increment was significantly lower compared to the controls. Meanwhile, the left coronary artery that is normal in both control and cases shows similar dimension uh, at the three different loading condition. In terms of uh, expansion in percentage, the anomalous aortic origin show only 1.8% increment in size compared to 6% of the control and 6% a higher load of 100 millimeter of mercury compared to almost 20% for the controls. Uh, in terms of final remarks, what we learned from our model is that actually biomechanical modeling might replicate the anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery and the aortic structure. And this is an important point when you are developing a model to be reliable on what you are representing because sometimes the model simply gives the output that you program it. And we ha you have to be sure that is not the results you, you, you tell the model to, to provide you, but the model needs to behave like a, a a true clinical uh, scenario. Simulation, as said, replicates the coronary behavior and the modeling allowed us to uh, assess each different uh, anatomical or functional condition. We might place any pressure, any heart rate, 
or any degree of uh, penetration of the coronary artery in the aortic wall or length of the intramural segment. The models can be easily populated with the patient data. It, at the time now, it requires uh, uh, some uh, time-consuming activity from the radiologist to retrieve the 25 parameters, but it is going to be uh, um, in the near future automated the way we are able to retrieve the parameters for the, for the model. The link between the simulation output and the clinical events is still lacking. We are not able to correlate now that these are the changes that we measure in the model actually means a uh, um, reduced flow in the, in the territory of the coronary that we are studying. And probably the clinical link is going to be um, the, in, the use of a methodology that is the fluid structure interaction that actually assess the, how a fluid behave inside a, a model that react to, to some pressure increase or stress that we apply. And the Marsden Lab in Stanford present very nice paper in the American Heart Association about this type of modeling, making probably uh, a linkage between the geometrical assessment and what is going to be a functional evaluation. Of course, it remains open that AFR is a, a way to assess reduced flow in coronary artery anomalies. And there is a lot of debate about its, its validity. But the fact that we are able to simulate a changes in flow inside the coronary artery, this is fundamental to move from theory to a clinical uh, setting. So nowadays, as I said, we are able to do all the anatomical assessment of the coronary, but probably integrating with the simulated flow, we are able to quantify precisely and safely the ischemic risk of the patient because all the work is done on a computer or a laptop. We are able to study the pathogenic mechanism and probably try to answer which is the best treatment in terms of medical, surgical, and also to predict patient outcome upon simulated surgery. So we might simulating the removal of the intramural segment by unroofing, uh, that is an easy procedure to simulate. It's going to be difficult uh, to simulate uh, the uh, procedure presented by Olivier or Najim in terms of reconstruction of the RVOT, but we are probably going uh, to be able to provide more details about uh, the potential outcome of this patient. I want to thank all the team that works with us, especially the, the Department of Bioengineer of the University of Pavia, uh, the people, the brain behind all this computer modeling. And I want to close my remarks uh, with a quote of uh, Corey Richard. He is a photographer from National Geographic. He is a climber and an athlete. He had a stormy story uh, when he was climbing one of the 8,000 uh, feet of the Himalaya mountain. He, uh, he was uh, hit by an avalanche uh, during the descendant and he was pulled out from the snow. And he took a picture immediately after he was pulled out the snow, he was thinking about he was going to die. And this picture became a cover of the National Geographic uh, issue that uh, tell about this, uh, this, uh, this story. When he returned home, he had uh, PTSD related to this event. Uh, he became uh, dependent by alcohol. And after some years, he reconnected to himself and get himself in a, in a right position. And he always talk about how to manage the stress after a failure and how to manage a failure. And this is important because uh, last year he trained for almost a, a year and a half to do a new route in the Everest and he failed when he was 7,600 feet, almost on the top of the Everest mountain. And he says that failure is a real means to success. And, and you have to fail as many times as it takes before you get it right. And this is especially true when you're doing biomechanical modeling, because you do a lot of assumption, you do a lot of uh, evaluation, and you do to test yourself every step you move into this field. Because only that way, as Corey said, is the way that defines perfection. And for children with anomalous aortic origin, as Najim said, we need to be perfect because we are preventing something that we are not sure is going to happen. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Mauro. Um, it was a great talk. Um, we're now moving to uh, our next presenter, Dr. Gatiano Tiene. Dr. Gatiano Tiene is a professor emeritus of pathology and consultant of cardiovascular pathology at the new University of Padua in Italy. He was one of the pioneers in the early studies of sudden cardiac death, and today he is sharing with us his findings on the pathological substrates of uh, AAOCA. And uh, with a particular light to the uh, mechanism for sudden cardiac death. Thank you, Dr. Tiene. Thank you. You see my slides? Not yet. Yes, we do. Yeah, no, we can see them. Yes, thank you very much. I'm sorry, sir. I am elated. It happens that the pathologist is plays the last role as usual. I did nearly 10,000 autopsy in my life and I know perfectly which is the natural history of our body. We collected as far as the sudden death in the young nearly 800 cases. And I would like to present to you our experience of these cases, which kind of anomalous origin of coronary arteries from the aorta are a cause of a sudden death in the young. A very, very difficult congenital heart disease to detect in life, life during life or even to suspect existence. Well, so let me start from the normal anatomy. The coronary arteries do not take origin from the heart, but from the aorta outside from the, 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 the heart. And while the veins drain into the heart, that is a paradox. Anyway, look at the here. I don't know whether you see that the, they take origin from the facing sinuses of the pulmonary artery. And they are the two perpendicular. And this is a very, very important issue to take in, in, in mind because uh, it's not a, a is acute angle origin. Well, let me start, which is the major cause of a sudden death, the origin from the wrong sinus. This is my first case that I did in 82. He was a, a soccer player and died suddenly during the last, the second time after two goals achieved, it dropped, died suddenly. And when I did the autopsy, I started to open the left and was normal. I was looking for the, for the right and was absent. I was back and I realized that the ostium of the right coronary artery was in the same sinus of the left one. And this is, and, and you see that the course of the right coronary artery was from here to reach the right atrioventricular sulcus. So it was amazing for me. This was the only defect there, the only cause of that. And this is another case, the opposite one. I was, again, a case of sudden death in a young, okay, young means 2018. I was opening the right, it was normal. I was looking for the left, was absent. I was back and I saw here a big float origin of the left coronary artery and coursing here before reaching the bifurcation into the left descending and the left circumflex. So I think that these images are clear cut in terms of, and you see the danger for both is the course in between the two major <coughs> great arteries. So you see that this is a perpendicular origin and this is a slit like uh, an acute angle origin with a slit like lumen. Stop here, look at here. 
this is a quite didactic picture. So this is uh, the origin of the left from the right. But while opening, well, here, you see that uh, this uh, first tract of uh, the left coronary artery is coursing in between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So this is a, a, the appearance is really a slit like lumen, flattened, but even more is coursing within the auric ball. This is the concept of intramural course of the anomalous, the anomalous coronary artery. In this particular case, it was the right one. Okay. I like uh, this approach that uh, this is the first time uh, the coronal approach. You see here, this is uh, the aorta, this is the pulmonary artery, this is the ventricular outflow tract, and most probably my colleague indicated that this is approach to enlarge the course of the coronary artery here. Otherwise, it remains slit like. Is it true? I wonder whether I, 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 I got your message. Is it true? You see, you listen to me? No, 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 she said, love it. Okay. Okay. So the, the major challenge is that we review it. This is a very, very famous, I must say, paper that Cristina Basso wrote many years ago. We were in, two, in 2000, uh, and this was a, the <clears throat> experience collected the experience from Padua and uh, the very Meron <clears throat> experience in the States. So, what is uh, amazing that the sudden death occurring after exercise or, or soon after. So is an exercise-related sudden death. The second issue is that we had 12 cases at that time. The second, oh, sorry for that. The second issue that the premonitory pre uh, cardiac symptoms, I'm sorry, I think that they were uh, at least 30 cases, sorry for that. And the, the syncope was absolutely in one third, not more. So unpredictable. But what was amazing is that the electrocardiogram that was available only nine, unfortunately, because in America they do not do the electrocardiogram from screening from uh, sport activity, was normal. And even the stress test was normal when available. So none of these had the clinical diagnosis, none of these had the sport disqualification and died and died. So I must say that the echocardiogram in good hands may be effective, but to my mind, the imaging, the best imaging is a tomography or is magnetic resonance. And there is no doubt that this is a, like a now topsy figures in vivo. Okay, so I want to take into consideration now another disease. I, I, I don't know, from this meeting, I think that nobody uh, was coping with uh, this anomaly uh, at the risk of sudden death as well. So the origin of the left circumflex artery from the right one and the core retroaoric course you see here with the left circumflex coronary artery arising from the right coronary artery with a, a wrong course. And then you see here the main left trunk, trunk <clears throat> dividing in the intermediate and the left descending coronary artery. So this is the piece, the specimen, and you see here the course of the left circumflex artery behind the aorta. So everybody believes that this is a, a benign condition. I can tell you, and I want to show you a case 
in which there was uh, this anomaly. Look at here uh, this left circumflex uh, coursing uh, behind uh, the aorta. You see here that uh, the lumen is patent. Uh, th there is a very modest, uh, very mild coronary atherosclerosis, but, but uh, here, I don't see here, maybe that uh, you see here, Anyway, there was a, I don't see here, unfortunately, because it's covered by your face. Uh, okay, fine. You see here, there was an old myocardial infarction, a scarring, a subendocardial, and was, this was a cause of probably ventricular arrhythmias, ventricular fibrillation. This was a, a rhythmic substrate, and it was in, in this was the in fact, related artery. So in other words, even though this is patent, but it was anomalous. And so maybe that indeed, this was anomalous origin of left circumflex was the cause of myocardial infarction and sudden death. So last issue that, one of the last issue that I, I would like to take into consideration is uh, the condition of I, take off of the coronary artery. Well, usually the, you know, we know that the, okay, uh, yes, indeed. You see here, this is the right coronary ostium in the right sinus. This is the left coronary ostium in the left sinus. But usually the position is just the in correspondence of the sinotubular junction or just below. We did a, a, an investigation on normal heart, and I can tell you that at the maximum, the normal condition, the normal height is 2.5 millimeters far up from the sinotubular junction. Look at here. This was 18 millimeters above. So this is a high takeoff. Sudden death again, the only explanation of sudden death. And look at here, this is a, a rare case published, and this is a, a, a tomography you see here, that is a, the origin is quite far from the auric root. And this was an anomalous origin of the right going down up to the right atrioventricular uh, circus here. And this is the equivalent. So if you have this first course coursing within with an intramural course so this in, within the auric wall, the condition is the equal of the origin from the wrong sinus in terms of slit like lumen. And say so maybe at the risk of sudden death. I wonder whether none of you had experience of this type of anomalies in terms of surgical repair. Well, summarizing and before taking into consideration also the myocardial bridge, because the myocardial bridge is not a anomalous origin, but is an anomalous cause. But I would like to summarize. Our experience is such that Anomalous origin of coronary artery, congenital coronary artery, is here, place is the third cause of sudden death in the young athletes. The first one in our hands in Italy is arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, 27%. The second one is a premature atherosclerosis in 24%. But you see here that the anomalous origin of coronary artery place it takes in is 16 percent so in the third well before well before our dissection well before myocarditis but well before of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy okay so now so it is an important issue the problem is the prevention of a sudden death of course the to my mind Rest, not doing effort should be enough, but you are at risk there and you need, there is no interventional cardiology possibility to make any repair. 
the surgical surgery is absolutely indicated there. So now, there is also this problem. This is another big problem. That is when there is a, a big myocardial bridge over the anterior descending coronary artery. Look at here. This is very nice because this is left the left main trunk. Here is the circumflex. Here is a cor descending coronary artery. And by the way, this is muscle here, the bridge, intramural course, is just over the first septal artery. So this may be also a, a, a very, very malignant uh, association that is uh, the bridge over a septal coronary artery. But now, this is the histology. Okay, the, you see here the left anterior coronary artery, okay? We, use, we say that if there is at least of 2.5 millimeter thickness here, and the length of the anomalous course is five millimeters, this is considered a situation at risk. I want to draw your attention here to the fact that the, you see here that the coronary artery, the left anterior descending, is completely surrounded by a circle of muscle that may, may play, I, sorry, may play a sort of a superimposed spasm over other than simply a bridge. Okay? Look at here, this is a, another issue. And 30% of patients, normal patients, present with the intramural course. Not so deep, but they present a breach. Okay. But there is an anomaly there, a cardiomyopathy, in which the bridge, the intramural course, is the equivalent of part of the malformation. And this is the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a very, very old case that we, by the way, published in the New England Journal of Medicine many years ago in a child that had a myocardial infarction here in, uh, you see, a symmetrical hypertrophy huge of the ventricular septum with a 3 to 1 ratio with uh, the free wall of the left ventricle, you see. And this case stayed there 20 years without any interpretation. I had the fortune to review the specimen and by opening the left anterior descending coronary artery, I found the bridge. So <clears throat> the bridge in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the expression of the disease, one of the landmark of the disease, because indeed, if you compare the incidence of the, the bridge in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with the control, control means that it is normal heart. In the normal heart, they are 30%. Here, they are 40, 45%. And there is no doubt that, that, that there is a significant difference there. Okay. So, may the bridge play a role a systematic role in precipitating sudden death in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, I want to show you a series of cases. Well, this is well known that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with time present scars, myocardial scars following a myocardial infarct most probably, and they are easily detected nowadays with the gadolinium carrier magnetic resonance. Okay. In this particular case, indeed, by the way, there was scars here in the territory of a left descending coronary artery, and the left descending coronary artery presented the intramural course. So uh, we believe that indeed there is a precise relationship there in between. Uh, 
in between the presence of the myocardial bridge and the presence of scars at the risk of arrhythmic sudden death. The substrate, scars, is a subs arrhythmic substrate. Well, look at here. So, in other case, we have the same intramural course. Look, look at it, very deep indeed. These are three millimeters, four millimeters above. But in the septum, there is no existence of scars there. And the sudden death occurred the, the same. And here, look at here. This is a case, it's the first case in my experience, was a soldier doing <clears throat> sport activity there. And sorry, the exercise activity. And you see that there was a, a large scar, surely post-infarction, but the left anterior descending coronary artery was not intramural. So now, and this is the final one. Uh, why don't we need this? Uh, we, we, we examined, I can tell you, the incredible, uh, it was 150 cases, uh, post-mortem 50 uh, cases of hypertrophic myopathy. We, <clears throat> the final sentence was the myocardial bridging is a frequent component of the hypertrophic myopathy phenotype, is a phenotype experience, but lacks systematic association with sudden cardiac death. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tiene. Uh, I'm gonna ask Anusha to start like with the pool, the second pool. Hi, everybody. Um, Sasha, do you have the questions? Do you want us to do the poll? So question one from Dr. Lorito, would you consider to use simulation output of a biomechanical model for clinical evaluation? I guess this is more of an opinion question. Hopefully everyone's going to say yes. I think it's the future. I want to see how many people trust biomechanical modeling. <laughs> the next question is, which ma major weakness about simulation have you perceived? Most people thought there was a lack of correlation to clinical conditions. And a close second was too complex of a tool for clinical application. I do think that's true. We were having a talk this uh, weekend where we discussed how long it takes to really segment and produce all the models. And it's quite an onerous process, but hopefully in the future that'll be shortened significantly. Yeah, it takes uh, like uh, two days work of an engineer for uh, running the simulation uh, on the computer. It does not actually need to work two hours, two, two days consecutively, but the computer before provide the output. But I think the most relevant part for the clinician is that it takes 40, 40 minutes to a radiologist to retrieve all the parameters. And it's quite a long time if we think that a CT scan of a coronary longs for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes to do the complete exam. So, but we are moving to automated standardization uh, of the parameters. So probably we are able to take out these uh, 40 minutes to the radiologist. Let's see. There is no more que question, uh, Anusha. Okay. Um, I think we can address some of the questions uh, for the second part that have been discussed in the chat. Um, to me, like one of the most interesting questions were regarding Dr. Raisky and um, national uh, techniques uh, in regards to the follow-up. 
uh, that is required after the procedure and also the uh, management of like the prostatic patch, like the, like that can be autologous pericardium or uh, some of the uh, attendants were proposing subpoenas patch, but uh, I think Dr. Reski already answered regarding that, but like, how would you manage this material? If I uh, may go first on this. Um, so yeah, I saw a couple of questions about the uh, possibility of fibrosis. So um, as you've seen from the video, uh, I use a generous uh, autologous pericardium, non-tan, for a reason I don't want it to really first calcify because once you tan the pericardium, there is a possibility for calcification to or fibrosis in it. And it doesn't really cause a lot of reaction. Now, uh, does it affect the right ventricular function? No, because we have actually know for probably hundreds or thousands of uh, autograph being harvested at that level, it really does not affect the right ventricular function. So it doesn't. And I think just elongating the entire RV outflow tract will stay, uh, keep that space in front of the uh, left main enough that it's not gonna uh, first get compressed by a muscle or, or become symptomatic. And what I found in some of the cases, the thickness of the muscle over that left main is variable. Sometimes you actually open the RVOT and you could actually see through the endocardium the, the artery and then it digs down and then up again. So and there are some areas where it, it is like five or seven millimeters down and sometimes they're only, only uh, endocardium on top of it. So there, there are variations of how they are and there's one which is coming up, which is uh, gonna be even more complex where the left main divides into an LAD within the septum itself, and then emerges later on closer to the apex. This is an even another compli uh, complicated course of that. So we're just uh, starting to understand all these anatomies and how we best uh, treat these patients. And that's, uh, and that's why I think it's important to do a lot of uh, extensive pre and post operative testing to make sure that we're doing the right thing for those patients. Thank you, Dr. Um, our main concern uh, using a patch to, to, to do an osteoplasty was not to get calcification or aneurysm later. We started with this technique for, as I said, arterial switch, who has a late coronary stenosis probably 30 years ago. And at the beginning of the, our experience, we were using a saphenous vein and we had some aneurysm, but it was quite easy to do because it's quite thin and, quite, uh, and has quite the same mechanical properties as the uh, initial segment of a coronary. But then, because of this aneurysm, we moved 18 years ago to the perigoneal patch. And I have to say that uh, despite a very close follow-up of this patient with CT scan for the arterial switch, we haven't seen any calcification or uh, aneurysm so far. All of this patient uh, has uh, some aspirin for six months, and usually we stop for the younger patient and keep aspirin for the older patient when it is uh, anomalous coronary artery and when they are older than 20 years old. Thank you very much. And one last question for Dr. Tiene. Uh, what is the role of the pathologies in the clinical decisions? Like what, like what is, what do you think is nowadays the role of the pathologist in this spectrum of disease? I, I you are from Padua, know our fashion is uh, we keep uh, a clinical pathological conference uh, every week. And this clinical pathological conference is in pathology. It's not a clinician. The clinicians are coming, the clinicians are connected and so on. But the role of pathologist, first, the pathologist in cardiovascular disease should be a cardiologist and pathologist. Because the pathologist without the background of a physiopathology is useless, absolutely useless. So the pathologist should play 
a central role of teaching and research uh, and for especially for translational investigation in any center. The problem is that the cardiovascular pathology is unique in Italy, unfortunately, because only in Italy it was possible to achieve both grades of specialization, pathology and cardiology. This is not existing in the States. This is not existing elsewhere. So the destiny of pathology is useless if is is not also a cardiologist in the cardiovascular medicine. Yes, Sorry for that. Totally, no, totally agree with Dr. Tiena. It's very nice the environment that has been created in Padua in this regard. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Anusha for the final discussions. I just want to thank everyone um, for being here today. It's been a great session. I'd like to thank all the speakers for making the time to do this. I think it's been very informative for all of you who participated. Um, I would welcome all the people who have signed up to attend that if they have any questions, please reach out to us, as I'm sure the most of us would love to answer any further questions you may have. Sasha and Grace. Thank you very much. It was amazing. Hope to see you all on Friday on Dr. Anderson's session. And thank for all the speakers and thank for all of you who attended today. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.